in the interest of time, I think we'll, we won't we won't waste any more. We'll just get it rolling. Uh, I know that folks will be coming through uh, as we continue on. Um, we, we know that, that there's going to be some really, really valuable insights here from Zico tonight, so we don't want to lose that opportunity. I'll just say a few things. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Vince Minhares. I'm the development officer at Harbor Basketball, and uh, this is, I think, session five now, Matt, or I think our fifth fifth session, sixth session, sixth session uh, in our coach uh, development series that we've been running during uh, Auckland kind of level three lockdown. Uh, and, and, and certainly probably the, it looks like this might actually be our last one for this little period. Um, uh, but, you know, certainly save the best for last, I think, right? Uh, you know, this is a session where we're going to dive a little bit deeper. And I'll give some context here before Matt introduces our, our speaker tonight, um, Zico Cornell. But, you know, I think for us, we've, we've, we've reached out to Zico um, to talk a little bit about uh, his views on offensive system design. And I think the, the purpose here for and the rationale here was uh, we wanted to get deeper with um, the way in which we play offense and particularly the way in which we create advantage um, in offense in offense against good defense. Uh, I think as a club, certainly in New Zealand, I think we're seeing that trend of wanting to play good basketball, you know, um, a, a greater recognition of of the value of playing that kind of advantage domino style basketball, um, taking great shots, you know, having great spacing. But I think we, you know, certainly our club this year and, and many others would would appreciate the challenge of kind of late season needing to have, a, you know, quite a bit in, um, you know, in your back pocket and, and having more things to go to against good teams at end of season. Um, and I think that's part of the motivation uh, for this session and certainly for me and, 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 and the questions that we'll be asking is, you know, if your first advantages aren't aren't if your first actions aren't creating advantage, then what, what do you do next systematically? And uh, part of what we're gonna ask Zico to, and what we've asked Zico to do in terms of his brief is, you know, help us be more systematic in our offensive, you know, design, particularly our half court offense, um, you know, share with us some of the principles and concepts um, that he uses um, and anything that generally you, you know, his, his experience and his, you know, depth of understanding could, could help us and other New Zealand coaches get better in this area. So, um, you know, I'll kind of leave it at that, um, but, but certainly very excited for this session and, and very happy that Zico agreed to, to jump on this call with us. So Matt, why don't you uh, say a little bit about Zico and, and a few other things to share with the group? Yeah, cool. Thanks. So it's really, really well laid out. Um, yeah. Evening, everybody. Um, just got a couple of things to go through before we hand it over to, to Zico. Um, just obviously, if we can keep our um, mics muted, um, we'll again take questions um, from the audience. We've got a few questions already asked in the RSVP process, but if you do have a question, feel free to, to um, put that in the chat and we'll, we'll, we'll get those to Zico throughout um, the Zoom. Um, and really not really much of an introduction needed, I guess, for, for Zico, you know, super, you know, well-respected, um, you know, one of the most respected coaches in the country um, has been involved in, in really every, every level in this country, um, currently with the Shimani Susanu Magic, if I got that right, um, in, in Japan under, under Paulie. Um, and I, and I think they're kind of in a mid, we, we got, we got a time frame here from Zico. I think it's a 10 day, um, kind of break in the season, which is, which is extremely hectic for him. So we really, we really appreciate his time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could go on and on and on about what he's done and what he's doing, but, um, maybe more time for him would be best. Um, so just before I do hand over to him and, and maybe it's something that Zico wants to chat a little bit about, um, Zico has donated his presentation uh, fee to the Coach McKean Fund. Um, and so I'll leave Zico to say a few words about the fund, but we'll put the link um, to the fund in the chat and also on the follow-up email if you want to find out more information about it. Um, and also the, if, you would, if you are able to, to donate to the fund as well. Um, but I'll kind of let Zico explain a little bit more about that. But um, yeah, thanks for that, Zico, and, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for having me and the time that people are dedicating to listen. Um, I think like as a way to pay it forward, Coach McKean, I think we'd all agree that was very significant for New Zealand coaches. Um, I kind of had two people in mind when 
we got on the plane down to Dunedin for our first game of the New Zealand NBL season that I had in mind, I guess, like the season being four, one being Fata Latoa, who, you know, it seemed like a long time since he had, he had died, but 2020, you know, we kind of thought hopefully we could win a championship and his honor didn't occur for us with Saints. So we had to wait. And then uh, Coach McKean obviously was ill at the start of the season and we're hoping that he would pull through, but ultimately didn't. Um, so in some ways, as a new Plymouth kid, a way to pay it forward. And then if people feel uh, able and, and wanting to pay, I guess, it forward, if they got something valuable from this chat, then that would be one of the cool ways that you could pay it forward, though I'm sure many people are paying it forward in their respective ways in their community. So um, something for you to consider. And then um, I guess the rest of the time is, is, is for me to earn it, to make you feel like, man, that was very worthwhile and I, I want to pay it forward. So um, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting just in what you're saying to begin about you know, trying to get those wins late in the season. And much of what we will discuss here will be about 2021 Saints. There might be a few earlier teams, but uh, basically we approach the 2021 season like what do we need to do to win the final, not to win regular season games. Um, and so a big part of that study and that research was about studying the playoff games of 2019, not what worked during the regular season, you're playing some lowly team and many things work, but how did we have to play and how, how did we need to be successful to win the final games of the season? And then preparing ourselves by working on those habits all year round. I think, and always for a long time, have thought that you should be aspirational technically and tactically in the way that you play. So even if you maybe have and under 13 or under 15, a relatively young team, obviously you're not going to do the depth of tactics that an NBA or EuroLeague team would do, but do the things that you do apply to the highest levels of basketball. You know, could the things that your players learn, would they still be applicable and useful for them if they go on to the highest levels of basketball? Uh, there's so much to learn. And if you work on things that, oh, this will work for now and then we'll change it later, you don't have enough time. And, you know, you need to get on to the most important things they'll need to know eventually as soon as possible because it's going to take so many years for them to master those things. So I always think, you know, obviously I'm not kidding myself. The 2021 Saints would not beat the best FIBA team in the world, but would that team at least respect us? If we played Milan or Barcelona, Ephes, one of these great, great EuroLeague teams, they would beat us, but would they respect how we were trying to play? And would they see the theory of how we're trying to play and respect it? Uh, you know, hopefully that would be the case. So I would believe that to be true if I had an under 15 team or under 12 team or a high school team or whatever, you know, would the best team in the world respect what we're trying to do? Would their coach think like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing? Or would he think, well, I mean, it's just pick up ball that 10 people have shown up and roll the balls out and it's complete shambles. Um, mostly I'm gonna just share clips with you and talk to them. There is obviously an order and purpose to the clips. And one of the things that we spoke about when we were talking about the purpose for this talk, and, and obviously some of this is from a harbor perspective, though I'm sure there's coaches from outside of harbor, was getting to basically Canterbury and things that were looking nice and, and smooth offensively all year, suddenly bogging down and not working so well against Canterbury's defense. I think it's very, very important that you build a great defense in practice. One, because you wanna have a great defense, that kind of goes without saying, but that's also the defense that you get most of your reps against. So if you're bad defensively, your offense is only getting to practice against a bad defense. So you get to a game and you run into a good team where you can't mark them because we just established you're bad defensively and your offense can't score on a good defensive team because you're completely not used to it. So 
you know, the force that you play with and the setting up your cuts and all the little tiny fundamentals, you ain't used to doing them because you normally playing against a terrible defense, which you can just summertime and feeling good and everything's working and scoring, but terrible fundamentals. So all boats rise with the tide, your offense rises with your defense and vice versa. So one of the benefits we have for 2021 Saints is since it, these stats have been recorded, we had obviously relative to our competition, the best offensive rating in the history of the competition. So that's basically saying we were the most efficient offense that's ever played in the New Zealand NBL relative to its competition and the fourth defense of all time of all the teams. We had the fourth best defense of all time since that's been recorded. So mostly of the last decade plus when those statistics became available. So the benefit to us there is we are playing against the fourth best defense of all time at practice. So when we played against any other team, this is easier. You know, it's easier to play against their defense. And I think you saw that very much in the first six games of the year where we won, I think, by an average of like 26 points a game is that the intensity that we were used to playing at was just far too much for any other team to cope with. And their offense couldn't function because they were used to playing against their non-existent defense and they couldn't stop us either. So building into clips, like the first few are just from practice. Um, so hopefully this, sometimes my quick time freezes. If it does, it would be just a quick rectify it. Uh, but the first few are just basically of ball pressure. And one, you're gonna see it's Dion Prusta. Um, I don't think I've, I've been very fortunate to be with some very determined players in New Zealand NBL. I can think of Lindsay in 2010, Shaley at times. The Dion's effort this year to win a championship was as good, if not potentially more, in how much he contributed. Um, you know, he was basically our strength and conditioning coach as well. And editing clips, some of these clips are from Dion's edits of the games that he was sending through and, and, and analyzing. Um, and so, he set the tone and when your best player is playing like this in practice, and these all are from very early days in the season, that certainly sets a tone about how we're going to play, but you'll also see the young players having to play against this. And then there's no way they're going to see more pressure than this if they get an opportunity in any of the preseason games or the games going forward. So just running these clips, I mean, you know, he's basically playing like this every practice full court, pickups, deflections, turning. We had a lot of injuries with our young point guards during the preseason. So Kale Robinson, who's you know more of a wing, had to play point for the second unit. And this is what he had to deal with. Uh, and I'm sure it made Kale better. Um, you know, it's just even hard for anyone to get a catch and to make anything happen. And because of these things, I mean, this is body on blow ups and making it hard to get handoffs. So when we had to run our offense against other teams, you know, it was easy to get, we didn't have to deal with this. And you can see that, you know, in that chaos that was created, they start building the competency to be able to deal with it. So this is Matariki getting pressured, show makes exactly the right pass, Sam Gould makes the right pass, we generate a great shot. So, you know, those young players start to build the competency to make the correct decisions under that level of pressure. And the pressure can't, and I'm talking about technical pressure. I'm not talking about a, a zone press or trapping, that's tactical pressure. I'm talking about one-on-one, -on -one, your ability to heat up the ball and your ability to deal with it. And they're not really gonna face any more pressure than that. You know, I mean, obviously Dion just got signed by Melbourne United and the primary reason is for his ability to defend. Um, you know, they'd, he'd be up there. Shelly probably is our best extension pressure defender, but he's not in the league anymore. So they weren't going to find anyone who was going to pressure the ball more than that during the season. Um, so that is, is, you know, part of that idea of how you want to build that context in your pr practice. How you go about that for the most part is beyond the scope of this talk. You know, there may be other presentations about defense and there obviously is specifics. It goes beyond if it, and trying, there's technical aspects, there's tactical aspects, knowing how to mark actions correctly, 
Um, and that would probably be the last thing that I'll say on that is just that as we taught our offense, we taught the best practice to defend our offense. Uh, so that every step of the way we were dealing with the best practice defense against us. So it was never easy for us. It was always hard. And so like when you saw those handoffs getting blown up, like we wanted pass, pick and roll in those situations. But our way of marking that was to prevent pass, pick and roll, turn them into handoffs and then blow up those handoffs. So in practice, we almost never got to do pass, pick and roll. We almost always had to do dribble handoffs. But in the game, suddenly, you know, there were pass, pick and rolls. And then if the other team did play good defense, that wasn't a shock to us. It was like, oh, this is back to default. Like the rest was summertime is extra, extra. Um, phases of offense in some ways, transition to spacing, to triggers, to coverage solutions, to dominoes. We're not going to be able to cover all five of those facets. And there's certainly ones that we're going to cover more stringently. But it sounds like, at least from a Harvard perspective, for the most point, point, transition is good, done pretty well already. So cover it a little bit. And the main reason that we will cover it is because your transition leads to your spacing. So you want ruthless pursuit of efficient offense. And that has many aspects. And part about being ruthless is using the entirety of the shot clock. So as soon as we secure the ball, we're ruthlessly pursuing efficient shots. There's no lag time. There's no let up. There's no two to three seconds rest. This is more true of my 2019 Hawks team that it made sense for us, we believe, to play fast. 2021 Saints, we purposely played with precision and we were the lowest paced team. Pace is not a great statistic. There's a lot of silly things about it, but it gives you a bit of a general idea. We wanted to be the lowest pace team and we were. So these are the only real clips from two years before, but immediate reaction. As soon as you secure the ball, immediate reaction. Can you get a one, two second head start on your opponent? And then we want early width is the first thing. So, you know, without going through every single position, getting to the sidelines before the top of the arc extended. So Nelson, they've quite kindly put one of these white lines on the court around about the top of the arc. You want to be on the sideline, ideally, before you hit that mark. So you stretch the off uh, the defense east-west if the hoop is north, and now you stretch them north-south by sprinting to corners first. If you're on the same side as someone else, then to the 45, and at times you'll end up with three on the same side, so it'll become corner, wing, slot, and then that would lead to side pick and roll where you have to play lower on the other side so that you've got exit space but getting the early width first and then sprinting to corners so you'll see some none of these are necessarily going to involve five people being perfect so picking and choosing so this first clip for one you'll see the speed that ej singler plays with and the speed of reaction like at this point we have no advantage any more than nelson does you know they're in just as good a position to get back as we have to get down the floor but you're going to see that our guys react quicker than they do and they sprint harder than they do and the respective result of that, especially here. Like EJ Singler is starting from a disadvantage with, a, uh, with Granger. But width from Bowman, it's not perfect width, but it's the immediate reaction, it's the sprint. On this one here, you know, defense leads to offense, stop. And you can see, you know, say Dion's pathway. First, he was already higher than this, but first to the sideline, sideline. And you can see how the floor is open, right? There's no one in the middle, right? Benefit to having no one in the middle is there's no natural help. So if you, you can rim run, there's places for it. But if you run someone to the rim, if they're getting behind the defense, it's different, that's cool. But if you, they just run to the rim, even though their man is ahead of them, you've now put a help side defender on the rim and so now all other four players turn they see the rim being compacted and they don't feel compelled to sink if you see the rim being empty five people quite often feel compelled to sink because they see the rim being open and this makes the movement around the perimeter so much easier and opens the kicker heads the speed handoffs the catch and shoots right and a lot of times it expands everyone and then you just get space for a direct push if no one stops the ball. And you're going to see that was obviously from a point guard. 
And then in this instance, you're gonna see that same opportunity created for a big, obviously with people getting wide, Dion with width, EJ eventually getting width, kick it width, and now Bowman gets to come down and play one-on-one -on -one with basically no help side because everyone's been expanded. And it also gives him the counter, right? Like he basically knows no one's gonna be helping. Everyone's expanded and everyone can shoot. Now, if he gets cut off, he can make his counter moves knowing that there's space on the interior. He's not gonna spin back into a strip. It's gonna be spread. Kicks is obviously followed in for offensive rebound. Zico, this just a quick, quick question. Um, uh, everyone has the ability to uh, advance the ball or is the is it kind of uh, understand your skill set don't do it if it's not in your skill set but but generally speaking everyone is empowered to to advance the ball whoever rebounds I think you have to make an assessment about what is best for your team relative to the players that they will play against that year and also to what extent are you a developmental team and what extent are you a team that the intention is to win this year? So there's no hard and fast answer. For 2019 Hawks, a lot of teams have probably said they're trying to emulate this team and have failed to understand that all six players who are going to play minutes for this team can pass, dribble, and shoot. If that's not true of your team, then it may not be the best team to emulate. So with Saints, you know, one of the learnings for me from belatedly watching the showdown when it became relevant to research these players I'd never heard of before that suddenly are important in the New Zealand league that were bench warmers before uh, when it was a good quality league. Um, we had to research it. And what I could see is that so many teams didn't really win games. It was the lesser players lost them the games. Trying to do things that they couldn't do live turnovers, wasted positions, scores going the other way. And we knew there was going to be a huge discrepancy in experience and ability between our best players and very inexperienced players. So we wanted to play in a way that Dion would be out of control as much as possible, the positions. And so therefore we played through him much more extensively. And Someone like Kenneth Tuffin, you know, had his first season in the league, had a great season, led the league in three-point percentage, 49%, finished second in defensive player of the year, voting, uh, and, and everyone thought he had a great season, which he did. But part of it was because we hit his weaknesses. You know, so he played to his strengths, and you didn't expose the things that he finds difficult that may have, would have led to turnovers and caused people to think less of him as a player. And that also narrowed what we needed to work on in player development. If you make him work on 21 different things, you're going to hit them maybe once a month. It's not going to be enough. And you're going to improve in basically no areas. So KT's role was very, very simple. Spot up and catch and shoot at a high percentage. Jam. And he's a great offensive rebounder. And play full court defense. And that's it. And then his area for improvement was basically that if you got closed out hard, can you get to the point where you can drive a close out and finish with both your right and left hand and make the correct kick out pass if they help. And that was a point for him to work very hard on. And so that was a focus of his individual development. But four things, because he's only working on four things, we're able to hit on them on a daily basis. And he can shoot 49% from three, partly because he's a good shooter, but partly because he is ready. In that aspect mm. whereas if he was working on 20 things he probably is not going to be as polished yeah, cool. um so yeah it depends if you've got brandon bowman then it makes sense for him to push if you have tohi who's very smart great decision maker but it's also going to expend him physically it makes more sense for him to allow other people to do that job so he can concentrate on his core jobs you'll see this one here with right? You can very much see here how spread the floor is. There's no one in the paint. They've got poorly matched up in transition. Geordie Jet hasn't found anyone. Because generally people are going to run to the paint too. Like someone's going to run to the paint. And when they run there, effectively like a zone, there'll be no one for them to mark. And in this instance, that causes them to lose Daniel Kickett on the trail. And there's someone who this season shot 60% from three on five attempts a game. So this is not a great person to leave open. I think, you know, 60% is rather decent. 
sprinting to the corners, so early width, and then getting to the corners, one of the things that opens up, we're trying to open the middle of the floor. The middle of the floor belongs to generally the point guard pushing the ball and the five man involved in the triggers. So you'll see this one here, because Dion and EJ are out of there early and wide, it opens this kick ahead pass, right? Like Ethan's ready and it kills the run on. If Dion was say like here, then Blanchfield could commit to Ethan and Hiram would have a chance to get to Dion. But because Dion's so deep, Blanchfield is deeper and Hiram doesn't really have a chance to get the run on. So in this case, it means that Ethan's able to get all the way home before Blanchfield gets to him. And you can see if there was a kick out, there's two people ready and waiting. It's so much easier shot if you're already balanced and standing in the corner waiting to catch and shoot versus on the move for that shot. You see the width here and this time this allows kick ahead and now space. And you can kind of see the four round one spacing, right? The middle of the floor reserved for the six, three, five man, four other people spaced. So obviously if this was contained, then it's very easy for DJ to come into example, shape, pick and roll. We will talk about spacings as we go ahead. Shooters ready in the corner, especially Dion on that strong side. It allows DJ to get all the way home. Similar again for round one spacing. Bowman was a very instinctual player. In some ways, four people are going to do pretty prescriptive things. And then Brandon's kind of instinctually doing his thing within the context of that. But the spacing is there for someone to take the middle. And obviously, this creates a domino situation. Right. And that this is a difficult thing for them, right? Is they're playing traditional bigs. So look where they run. They're running to nothing. I mean, who's Crown Iverson going to mark? Paint. They run out of players. Mm. Next thing that we're kind of in many ways addressing is obviously this is something that probably a lot of teams are doing relatively well. And we're not really trying to go into the whole transition. That could be obviously a print whole presentation in its own right. But more the mindset of like your transition will lead to your spacing. So you can see in this instance that you're gonna have not necessarily both corners fill because I believe go to the nearest sideline. So sometimes you'll end up with an empty corner because going to the nearest point is the shortest distance and this is the most efficient and therefore makes you look really fast if you should run short distances. Um, but you're gonna end up with spacing and you can see here like we've got corner corner and you can see how deep dane has got and whoever the fifth person on the court here is probably KT. You can see that the middle is empty, it's spread, and here's our five man coming into drag screens. So for us, in our flow offense, so if we get a steal, a defensive rebound, or inbound the ball after a score, then we're in our flow offense, which we call Rio, Spanish for river, it flows, all right? Um, and so there were a few rules within it for the five man. If they're trailing the play, then they're coming straight into drag screen. Uh, if they, for whatever reason, were beating their man down the floor and got a rim run and they didn't get past the ball ahead for an easy score, then this put us automatically in what we would call four cook, which is to make a lag pass to the four man who would be trailing. And this would go into a second side action, which will definitely come up in the clips. If the four man had got out early and sprinted to the corner. So in this instance, Dane has done this, then it's automatic five man drag screens, no matter where he got to. If he rim runs, but the four man's in the corner, we don't bring the four man back out of the corner. Five man comes back up into drag screen if we don't get advantage. Um, and then they have to play all pick and rolls for that position. So they might have to go first pick and roll, second pick and roll, third pick and roll, so on. That's fine, four man stays in the corner didn't come up much for us because we play in heavy minutes with those two bigs and they are not, you know, they're not sure Mary. There's not a lot of times Dane is going to be flying to corners. Most of the time they're going to be heavy domination on the defensive boards. We're the number one defensive rebounding and offensive rebounding team in the league. They're going to stay in and be on the boards. And so therefore naturally tending to be training the play more so. So, 
you don't need to get that through. Um, I've got the other computer open for notes just to keep in my mind, but somehow she wants to interject herself. I never use her. Um, all right, you're right, Zico. So <laughs> going forward in this, right? So this one here, I think like the point being is just that we want to get to our spacings and then like if we play this forward, I'll probably, right? So this becomes, ah, oh, I know why. Because we're playing known spacings, this becomes really valuable here. Like, so Tohi knows where everyone is, right? There's no B, a non-specific place. So it opens up like where he basically throws a blind kick out pass to the corner, right? On a 360 turn, because he knows Dane will be there. And then uh, this next clip in some ways to put, oh, well, you can see the note, but in some ways to put to the panel or to put everyone listening, whose fault is this clip, right? Who is at fault for this turnover? I mean, for the ease of like time frames and things, it's probably not people have to answer. I think like superficially, most people say, well, Dion Prusta just threw that ball out of bounds. It's his fault. And the way we play, this is not Dion's fault. This is Kenneth Tuffin's fault, right? And this is why, I mean, some of these clips have got notes on them because they're the notes that went to the players and their individual feedback. And I was not pleased with Kenneth at the time. Like, Kenneth, why the fuck would you cut here? Right. This is not part of anything that we do. And this cut is KT's fault. Right. KT, extremely diligent young man who doesn't care about this. He just wants to be good. Like, tell me what I need to know. You don't need to sugarcoat it for me. And this is why he's going to go far. But there's no point for him cutting here. I think like youth basketball, too often people get told if you're standing still, you're doing the wrong thing or something equivalent to that and it creates a lot of players who feel compelled to move and normally there's no point to the movement like you should cut for a purpose and this cut has no purpose right like there's no reason for him to cut and all he's done is created an unknown spacing because as Dion runs this middle pick and roll and Jack has obviously come sort of high and Romero's open on the roll Dion needs to be able to trust that if Sam Smith here is in on the tag on the roll, that he's got past backside corner on middle pick and roll. And he throws it to exactly the right place. Kenneth should be standing there. So if he throws this ball out of bounds, this is Kenneth's fault. Dion's throwing the ball to the right place and KT wasn't standing in the correct place. He's made a non-purposeful cut. Obviously, you'd like Dion to see that and everything, but... We're not trying to surprise our teammates. You know, we want it to be metronomic and we want repetitions. And Dion's got repetition and middle pick and roll, not in Kenneth making some cut for no purpose and not being in the correct position. Zico, in the sense of like the multiple kind of, I know you talk about, you use the term known spacing, which I think is a really cool term. Maybe you can talk a little bit about more, more about that, but is it a universal across all of your kind of, um, kind of configurations that the corners are filled is it, is it no okay so i mean i'm going to go through a lot of our main spacing but in this one here this is middle pick and roll yeah for us right so this is a known spacing we can always come back to middle pick and roll and a middle pick and roll this is corner corner 45 man behind and the ball screen on the midline um so this is a known spacing this is a spacing that we have very deliberately installed and scaffolded and build it up our practice within it and we'll cover it more extensively later so this is a known spacing um and it, i think that'll be re really come up a lot so hopefully that'll make more sense as we go forward but this is katie's fault cool All right so now you know this idea of coming back to spacing we always kind of knew we could come back to a known spacing. And when we're saying some ways a known spacing, we're also some ways saying like, come back to our practice, honor our practice. So a big learning point for us for this was day one of preseason and we didn't play very well. And we played 
two halves, but let's say two games, and we have a, one particular possession, for example, which we address the next morning, where Dion got offensive rebound against Nelson and then turned around and tried to post up Tomingen. Next morning, he basically said to Dion, we all respect the immense amount of work you've done to prepare for this season. How much time have you spent on your post-up game? And Dion said, none, which I knew was the answer. He said, how many times at practice have we worked on you posting up? Never. So why, in the middle of the game, would you decide to post up? You haven't worked on it, and we haven't worked on it. And no one knows what to do when you post up. What have you worked on? Pick and roll. Then that's what you do in the games. All right? You do what you've practiced. You don't just bust out, make some shit up in the middle of a position, and no one knows what's happening. And, you know, your practice is not very relevant to what's occurring. You play no one's spacings and no one actions and things that you've prepared and know intimately. And everyone knows what to do. And you know where all your reads are and your passes are. And because we built that, you know, we can always come back to that. And, and you'll see a number of clips throughout this that we go through here. Um, you know, for example, this one coming out of transition, we develop nothing. You can see here, Kerwin coming back, bang, Dion spacing, and we're to no one spacing, right? So Dion's a little high and he needs to get a little wider, but we've got to shakes pick and roll here. But this is a no one spacing for us, deep corners. We have extensive practice by this point in shake pick and roll. And we've gone through basically, I mean, this is relatively early in the season, but every conceivable coverage that we could face against shake pick and roll we've worked on to varying degrees um, based on how likely you think you are to see them and we know what to do right and this one they mark it really poorly and he's able to get downhill get an m1 you see it here this is bad job by Kerwin in transition right so you can see here play no and spacing as it is so our transition here is leading us to side pick and roll where he should bring this ball down right in front of our bench and run pick and roll with an empty corner there's no reason for him to dribble this across the middle. We lose advantage, but we get back to no one's space. And you can see all the shifts, right? Dane saying shift, Dion's going till he's going to shift out. And we're going to get back, Dane back down to the corner. And despite us making a mistake, this is not ideal. The shape pick and roll should be lower and wider, but we're back into shape pick and roll. Right. And now we know our reads. This is the very similar read to what we spoke about before. Drop coverage. Who's the help man? Josh Aitchison off the backside corner. That's who Kua needs to look at. Is he helping? Yes. Kick out backside corner. Is he not? Lob to Romero Gill. He helps. It's easy game. And it's repetitive. Sometimes you lose advantage. So this one here is not obviously the Saints. This is Algaris. Little horn side play. Perfect coverage solution against show. Messy pass ahead, but an accurate technical execution. They lose advantage, bang, right back to the target player, right back to the middle, re-space, back to a no one spacing, solve the coverage again, into another coverage solution layer. Seamless, right? And you can see this, building early days, very early days here in practice, probably week one, uh, till he not here yet. So middle pick and roll, short roll, Right, Pitt makes the wrong pass. His looks are supposed to be Dion on the cut, Sam Gold on the slide. He throws it to the wrong side. We lose the advantage. Little driving kick sequence. There's going to be nothing off that. This is something to train your players. Sam Gold being very smart here. This is this young man here, 18 years old. No advantage. He's not going to start pissing around and trying to do a dribble move or anything now. He knows that we've lost advantage. He's going to be efficient with his use of the shot clock and he's going to play his role. He is not a creator for us. He's not a target player. He throws it straight back to Ezra, who is a target player for us. We re-space, pips right back in, and we're right back into shape, pick, and roll again, and we allow Ezra to make the creations. And you can see the awareness, right? Dion on the far side is reminding Sam to get down to the corner to create no one spacing. Sam's shifting there, and we can come downhill and play through our target player. There's another one here where we lose advantage, right? This time... You know, you can see that there's some conditions here. You don't need to worry about this so much. If you're very fast in your note-taking, you might be able to note it down, right? But 
Danny's cut when he shouldn't have cut. The, the condition is not correct for him to cut. It's a cut that he could make if the situation was right, but this is not the right situation. Show, messy pass. See, KT should have quick swing corner, right? Sam Gould helping off the corner. He should be able to basically bullet this to the corner. Danny's not there. If you can see it clearly enough, you'll see the look on Danny's face. Very high IQ player. Tells you that he knows he's messed up. Fuck it, I'm supposed to be in that corner to shoot. We lose advantage. We reignite. All right, ball straight back to the target player. Look at all the three people respacing. KT sprints to the corner. Danny out to the corner. We respace. We're right back into middle pick and roll. And now we make the correct read. All right, so it's back to a no in spacing. Zico, just really quickly, I think um, you made the comment there again. It was another instance of a player sort of cutting when it wasn't the opportunity to cut. And it does raise a question that Scott's brought up in the in the chat that I think is pertinent, which is, um, can a deep corner player not backdoor cut if his defender loses sight of him? Must he always hold that space? And I think that kind of raises the question of how are we coaching players on when to cut um, versus when not to cut? I think it's an important question given given what you've shown so far. I think like if you're involved in a trigger there, like for example, if I was going into a corner zoom with that player yeah. and you know, you can then back cut him. Um, if it's in general play, there might be chances to sneak. But if we get to a no in spacing and we're playing pick and roll, then that pick and roll trumps everything. Mm. So you don't break the spacing unless there's a real purpose for it. We could talk about morphs, which is like going from level three to like 19 real quick. So we're probably not going to get there. But like, <laughs> <Probably not. laughs> um, there are times where you want to show one pick and roll spacing to bait a certain help and then shift the spacing to punish that help. But for the most part, you don't have to take everything that's presented to you. Just because the defender loses sight of you doesn't mean, like, I could back cut, doesn't mean that I have to back cut. A lot of times, being good offensively involves turning things down. You don't need to evaluate every opportunity. You need to know very clearly which ones you're going to take and which ones you're not going to take. And just because one's presented to you does not mean you have to take it. And I think this is very poorly understood mm. in New Zealand youth basketball where players and probably to a degree coaches play like you have to take every opportunity that's presented to you mm. and you don't. Then it's just a complete mess. Know which opportunities you want. For us, the spacing on the pick and roll is more important so that we have no in spacing, no in reads, no in passes, and we're not surprising our teammates. Magic Johnson can deal with you doing something random and making a great pass. The 99.999% of players need to know where they have to look and what things they need to look at to make their passing decisions. So if you do a cut that no one was expecting, you're probably causing a turnover. And it's then like an apology, like, oh, sorry, my bad, Fuck, I almost hit you. Yeah, but that's the cutter's fault. It also feels so, like, sorry, it just also feels like what you're saying is we're not taking away your freedom, but what we're saying is you need to understand the plan for where we are at and what we're trying to do within this scheme. And so you you do have some, you are some reads in there, but the reads are a lot more narrow and they're more sort of within the context of this particular action that we're running that we want to run that's going to give us a competitive advantage. I mean, win, I think, like lower level coaching what to coach, how to coach. Then to a degree, what, like who, who to coach? Because obviously at lower levels, you probably like who, the basic basics, everyone. It starts getting a little bit higher when you start talking about why, why do you do something? But I think the best coaches, when. Like when do you do something? That is the thing that separates. So if you can teach your players to understand when they should do something, that's when they become a really good player. And so as coaches, if we can get better at understanding when to do things, which may be a different answer for a different team, but that is a big thing, when to do it. So it's not inherently that that cut is wrong, but you must do it at the right time with the right purpose. And is it a restriction of freedom? In some ways it's like, well, it is, but this is in some ways like an ephemeral kind of discussion that in some ways maybe doesn't really mm, putting where they are on the freedom continuum in some ways doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, 
because we're trying to be a collective entity. And so there's going to be some level of restricting freedoms to make these five people function harmoniously. Um, they can't all be thinking independently. Um, so this position here is a kind of a good example of how we can get back to known spacing. I was just in the final, Kuhn's dr driven, it hasn't really worked out for him, 14 seconds on the shot clock, he gets himself in trouble, bad pass. We're pretty scrambled here. We, you can see he's checking shot clock, 11 seconds, bang. You can see KT, don't know what he's doing, setting a flare screen, he gets out of it, Dane getting to the corner, but we're very quickly getting ourselves back to middle pick and roll and we're straight into middle pick and roll and now we know what we're doing in the middle of the position. You'll see this, we lose advantage because of a little bit of a technical mistake. So this is in the middle of a set, till he gets his dribble deflected, we kind of lose the advantage, right back to middle pick and roll. Right now, Dion knows where to look and what he's doing. Hiram, chronic over helper, right? So he's always a good candidate for finding kickouts against, right? So he's on the over help, on the roll. So then you kick it out. Right, this one here, baseline out of bounds. Ezra makes a bad read on the back screen to slip out of it, right? They're not in show. The slip out that he's making will be to punish show on Spain pick and roll, but Adam Dunstan isn't showing, 41. So Ezra's made a bad read, so we lose advantage. He boomerangs it right back, right back into middle pick and roll, right? And we're right back in with nine seconds on the shot clock. We have time to work, and this is a spacing we're extremely familiar with. We've practiced this a shitload more than Franklin has practiced defending it. Almost can guarantee this. We're more comfortable with knowing what we're doing here than they are, right? They get Ezra on a little road runner downhill, no one's spacing, he knows where his passing options are. This one's kind of toying with them. I like this position. It's like a cat playing with a little mouse. But we get downhill, kick out, bad reef space by Kerwin. We lose a game against Hawks Bay because he makes this exact reef space and loses us the game. But we lose advantage because of that, but we're right back into shape, pick and roll. Isaac's got a guard on him now. He's doing something that... I wouldn't let most bigs do, but he's very smart, which is called bait to fix it. So you make them think they can switch back out of the pick and roll and you trip them into trying to switch back out and you slip out empty. So he's gonna make them think they can switch and slip out early. And now this becomes a short roll cut and slide read for us, right? So when he makes this, this is basically automatic cut for the two side low till he should be sliding, but off shape pick and roll, there's plenty of space so they don't know how to get out of it. This one here is off offensive rebounds, right? So offensive rebound, 14 seconds, right back to a no in spacing. We talked about four cook. This is where it goes to the four man on the trail. He goes second side. You can see Dion's denied. So he's already telling Leon to go second side. Dane's into second side action. Back to the middle, back to the target player. Dion denied, so we go straight to the flash read. Right, and we punish them for denying the primary option with something that comes worse for them. Right, so you know, always coming back to known spacings. I think it doesn't necessarily matter if you replicate the spacings that we chose, but with your team, I think you should think about do we have at least one, because this one might be a youth team, at least one known spacing that we know extremely well that we're extremely comfortable with, that if ever a position gets hairy scary, we can come straight back to it. I think that like that comes up a little bit at different times, there'll be further clips that will show um, this at times. Uh, so what spacings did we play is kind of, the next point. So I'm going to talk about side pick and roll, shake pick and roll, middle pick and roll. And we'll show some of the options against this. This is not really talking about all the different coverage solutions that are in play, but you will see some, but it, 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 it's the spacing. So for us, this is side pick and roll. Normally we would play spacings as we found them, which would mean that because KT ran the sideline in Rio, that he would stay in that corner. But against Hawks Bay, especially in this game, we felt that they were really struggling to defend side pick and roll, which you will see. And 
that we wanted to play a lot of side pick and roll. So in this instance, we started saying to clear him off that corner, to swing through, or it wouldn't necessarily have to be KT, but whoever's there, clear off so we can play side pick and roll, especially against their drops coverage, right? So you can see for us, it's not perfect spacing because Kerwin's having to bump back up off the corner and Dion could have got this ball lower, which you will see in some of the clips. This is something that you constantly have to kind of nag your point guard about on side pick and roll. It's easier for them to run it higher. It's better for them to run it lower unless the team is dumb enough to show on a poor space side pick and roll, in which case running it higher is better. But I talked about at the very start that we aspire to play tactical basketball that the best FIBA team in the world plays. So we're not preparing to beat a dumb team. We're trying to prepare to beat a smart team. So what will we need to do to beat the smart team? If we're good enough to beat the best FIBA team in the world, we will beat the dumb teams anyhow. Right, so first thing we're thinking here is obviously you're able to get downhill. There's more specificity to this, but you'll see very clearly side pick and roll. Right, one of the things that side pick and roll can be useful is it opens the pocket pass because Dion doesn't have to account for backside corner help that he would if it was shake or middle pick and roll. This is probably the simplest pick and roll to run and probably the most simple to defend. It's probably the lowest level spacing. But sometimes when you need a bucket and you're playing a low level opponent, then it might be useful to go to it. This one here, Ahmed, third string point guard. This is early, does a pretty good job of this setup. So a lot of times, like if the team is smart and you can't really necessarily see the whole court, if they're in side pick and roll and they see this loaded spacing, a smart point guard will try and hold this ball high and not let you get it low so that you can basically play in a zero coverage and get the wall help from the four man. And there is no gap to drive and there is no two on one advantage with the kick out. He'll be out of wall and recover. This is not a good situation for the offense. So how do you rectify it well if he's going to try to cut you getting to the corner with his body position you attack in middle if he doesn't cut you off the dominoes are falling and you play advantage basketball he will cut you off then you attack him to the baseline so you attack here get cut off you're okay with that you attack him to the baseline and you try and burn him along this baseline if he doesn't cut you off you have baseline penetration dominoes are falling if he does cut you off you've got the ball down basically to around where the break on the three-point line is, and now you have an exit zone to come off into with your pick and roll. Ahmed here, it's not an issue exactly, but he attacks the middle, gets cut off, attacks into the baseline, doesn't get cut off. Okay, so we go take the layout. You'll see here, right? Another thing with it, of course, is like the Hawks Bay want to switch. This is not a bad strategy for them. It obviously reduces the scoring in the final makes it in some ways covers for their inadequacies tactically, defensively, and makes it more of a technical game, which makes sense because they're much better as individuals than a collective. But we slip out of the this here and Ethan can't get under the switch and this opens the lob. And one of the ways you beat the peel switch is the lob. If this is a bounce pass, the peel switch can get deflection. You put it in the air and the guard cannot do anything where you can foul and get away with it. All right, you see it. Run roll here is another little thing. Some of these things I'm going to just throw to you and you make it with what, it, what you can. Like run roll coming down, basically running through the pick and roll and getting out fast, All right? So not staying in it. As soon as JK is disadvantaged with Dion, and in this instance, there's huge separation, till he doesn't need to screen him. JK is already cooked. So what... Tohi now needs to do is put heat on Jordan Hunt and create two-on-one advantage. So he doesn't need to stay on the screen. He gets out of there. He uses the momentum of his run up the court, and he's now behind the play. Jordan Hunt feels uncomfortable helping on the ball because Tohi's behind him, and he's basically stayed with the roller because he doesn't want what happened on the previous clip. I know this game preceded it, but he doesn't want what happened on the previous clip to happen here with the lob. And now Dion's able to get all the way downhill for the layup. Right, a little bit lower, better spacing to a degree here. Right, 
This is what Jordan Hunt doesn't want to have happen, where he allows the roller to get behind him. So these are the things, in fact, that this is the same game and this is the first half. So this is probably in Jordan's mind when he marked that third previous clip. I've already given Tohi the roll behind me. It's not a bad one for attacking switch. Dane's able to get Ethan sealed high side. There's no one to help for him. This one here, no resistance from JK, but you can see Kewen does a good job here of getting the ball down, right? So we basically want to play slots and corners. And because this is a three side with corner, slot, and there'll be another guy here effectively to slot. If you play this pick and roll high, you'll run into the wall help. So the empty spot for the ball handler here is the corner. Kewen gets himself super deep. So now we want him to be able to turn the corner below the free throw line extended. If he turns the corner below the free throw line extended and Hiram wants to help, then Dane is open on the pass. If he ran this pick and roll up here, Hiram can help and mark Dane. Right? They switch. One of our big things against switching was to keep the flow. When teams switch, they want to bait you into becoming stagnant and truncating your offense. If you're very, very highly skilled as individual players, that this can make sense. But we don't really have that level of players in New Zealand, maybe only one or two. I'm talking like you can truncate it if you have James Harden or Elijah one in the block. We want to keep the flow. You know, we want to be a good team tactically, play as a team. We're not trying to lose our flow against their switching. That's what they're going to try to trick us into doing, to playing individual basketball, which is what they're good at, what they practice. We're a team. So we're not going to take the bait. So we go second side, right? JK, Tohi maybe have post up here. But because we're staying in movement, you can see instead of dealing with complete compression on a stagnant post up, everyone's dealing with action, right? We always wanted to run our actions for our target players. So depend Dion's the target player. KT's the role player. So this play is going to be for Dion. Right? We don't want KT to run pick and roll. So he's always going to do what he needs to do to make this play for Dion. So if KT was high, he would cut and go out to the opposite corner and we would work with Dion. KT's in the corner. He can flare for Dion and slip and go to the opposite corner. Or Dion can pin for him and we twirl it and bring Dion back into the second side pick and roll. But KT will never get involved in the pick and roll unless we make a mistake. We want to play like it's championship position. And if it's championship position, then the play is for Dion, not for KT, right? So KT comes in on the flare and slips out. This opens Dion for the flare. He gets the catch and it opens the rip baseline. And we've stayed in flow and we're able to get a layup. You know, we don't have to play that initial switch. You don't have to play everything. This is exactly the same. All right, side pick and roll, second side, there's the flare. This time... Right, KT is more, this is obviously deep in the game, bench in in many ways. In fact, yes, total bench in. So KT, well, not total bench. Troy McLean is 42 years old and he is not playing mop-up minutes. So one starter is staying in on the road. And in this instance, this is KT. So he's now the target player. So he now receives the flare from Marnie, ripped to the baseline. You're seeing the same thing over and over. This is not coincidence, right? No in basketball repeatable, practiced, not random, not some surprise bullshit we made up along the way. The same thing over and over, metronomic, rip baseline. He knows where his looks are, kick out corner, catch and shoot. We've practiced and done this drill with KT time and time again. This is the thing he is weak at. Drive to the right decision. This is a huge play for him. This is reflective of hours and hours of work to be able to make the right decision in this situation. Right, Kewen gets it low. Great job with the spacing. Perfect spacing for side pick and roll. They switch it. We go second side. We don't have to take the bait of Dane on Devon Rick Walker. Flare screen. KT's not the target player. Dion is. They switch. This is okay. We don't get something wide open, but we do achieve something big here. Instead of their best perimeter or second best perimeter defender, JK on Dion, they have now switched their worst perimeter defender onto Dion. So Dion now gets to attack Ethan. So this is an advantage for us, even though it doesn't open immediate shot. And also this acts as like a prolonged boomerang. 
because Hiram, who has switched, is a big, and I also said he's a chronic overhelper. He can't help himself. He drops to a double help. JK's already got the help. Devon Walker's in more help position. He's three people removed from the person who should be helping, but he can't help himself. And that opens up the prolonged boomerang back to Kerwin, who he can't help leave for the catch and shoot in a big spot. Zico, quick question. Um, so in a, in, a, in a strong side pick and, or in a, in a side pick and roll situation, did you have other actions besides just the weak side flare coming out of that initial action if you don't have an advantage? Um, or was this sort of pretty much, this is what we do out of a, a, a side pick and roll and we when we hit the middle reversal? So that's like what I was saying about it depends where the target yeah. player is. Yeah. Okay. So if the target player's in the corner, then the 45 is cutting and yeah. out to the opposite side. And then we play pass, pick and roll with the um, target player in the corner. Cool. And then if the target player is high on the 45, then they had two options, flare screen or target player pins, but to twirl it. So twirl means like target player pinning down, bring around the rosy, curl off and curl back up into the handoff. It becomes another drag pick and roll. It, it might be worth kind of um, just throwing a couple of questions in here, I think, from our initial our initial um, survey um, when people registered, just because I think they're they're relevant to hear from you. Um, and I think I'm, I'm just ringing, raising them in my head. Um, you, you were kind of talking about um, whether or not Dion would ever post up. But one of the questions that I have is, do you post up, particularly do you post up bigs coming out of the, um, you know, the roll situation, or is it always sort of right back into um, another on ball? Like, do you, what is your position on pick and rolls as a secondary option out of your initial pick and roll? So it, one depends on who the player is and what their respective strengths are. Yeah. So if we went through our four bigs that we started the season with, our four primary bigs, mm -hmm. uh, Dan and Tuhi are allowed to post up and Isaac and Romero are not. Mm. Dane and Tohi are good at posting up. Dane, extremely good at posting up. Mm. And Romero and Isaac are bad post-up players. If they post up, then they sub out. One of them was better at buying into this than the other. Mm. And he got to win a championship. The other one, see you later. Um, so uh, it's also relevant to the coverage, right? So like, for example, middle pick and roll drops. Help comes from behind. You throw it back. This is a great one to smash for a deep pick, deep post catch. Yeah. Um, but it's it's always precise and it's purposeful and why? Like, what's the reason? When should you do it? Yeah. Um, we had sets like what we could call off of dead ball situations, and every now and then we would also use our sets in a live situation. Remember, we were the lowest paced team. So, you know, we were playing pretty controlled. This is to help us win in the second night of back-to-backs. Like we went to say Canterbury on the second night of a back-to-back, -back. we won by like 26, 30 points, partly because we were just gonna control it. You know, like we're gonna manage our effort and our load by just controlling. And we're just gonna play controlled every position and kill the tempo and, and, and manage the second game of a back-to-back. -back. We're not going to burn ourselves out. Um, and then that obviously involves playing through the bigs a little bit more. Um, side pick and roll here. All right, switch. So this is one where the target players in the corner. So you see here, Troy McLean, non-target player is going to back cut this and bring Dion into the second side pass pick and roll. Against us, this will be a handoff, but Huskies don't reattach. And now this is kind of like something that we'll cover and maybe later, but it comes up now, like sometimes you're almost looking to make combos, right? One hit, two hit, sometimes even three hit, four. Sometimes the first hit cracks the ice and the second hit shatters the ice. I don't mean ice coverage, I mean it, uh, metaphorically. So this first pick and roll, they switch and Kirwan, I mean, at least Nick Barrow thinks that Kirwan might have downhill. So he's sunk to get into shrink help. And so in some ways he's lost positioning with Leon Henry. Uh, he's quite a way off. He's separated. So the 
the defense doesn't really have control of us anymore, but they don't have, we haven't completely shattered them, but the ice is cracked. We kick it on and we go quickly to the second side and Nick is still only somewhat recovered. And so by the time we get to the pick and roll, he is in a drop coverage. This is not a very good idea with Leon Henry, who's an exceptional pick and pop shooter. You can play drops, but you basically need to wrap or peel switch. And this is not ideal because now Nick will have to switch on to Dion, which is not a good idea either. And obviously they miscommunicate and there's the huge separation. So the first pick and roll, crack the ice. Nick separated from Leon, but maybe not so much that Leon could shoot it yet. He obviously could, he's very capable. But he goes to the second pick and roll, ruthless pursuit of efficient offense. And now on the second pick and roll, Nick separates so far that now Leon, the ice is completely shattered. They have zero control of us. And also remembering that right back at the start of the sequence, they switched. So if Leon was to miss, here's Dane Samuel with a two guard on him on the weak side of the boards, exactly where the ball may ricochet to 70% of the time with the potential to exploit that if there was a miss. Engendering side pick and roll. Um, just a little bit of coverage solution for you here. Like side pick and roll, one of the things that some teams like to do, the Hawks like to do at times, was to ice these side pick and rolls or ice shape pick and roll. And this is where you have to be good in your coverage solutions. Um, so we will see, right, this is right coming out of half time. We talked about like they're gonna ice the pick and roll. Let's use the gas break, throw and go, and back cut this. Like, so we've just talked about this and they do a great job. So the first thing is Dion's got to put gas, so acceleration. And basically he's trying to drop this ice. He makes Devon, if Devon Walker won't cut him off on the gas, then you go in and make the play. So he cuts him off and now his momentum is going the wrong way. And you should be able to come back to the middle. But in this instance, Devon Walker on the pass back chooses to sit high side in which case this means that then it's back cut. It's not perfect in the gas, but the next one down, there's the gas, right? Till he's a shooter, Jordan has to leave the blue or the ice or the whatever you want to call it now and come back. And now we go into gas break, throw and go and into DHO. So JK cut Dion off on the gas. So he's not in push position anymore. So we can gain the middle on the handoff and obviously this opens up opportunities for Tohi to keep, get to the foul line. Gas again, bring it low, back high. Dion with the back cut set up, dribble handoff. They can't push it twice in a row. We have the middle. We get a little fortunate from here, but in terms of a gas break, throw and go, getting back to the middle, this is borderline as good as you could ask your players to execute because we've broken the push coverage. Right, they're trying to keep Dion out of the middle, and now he has the middle. From here, we get a little lucky. You know, obviously, we'd like it if the players combine that great gas break throw and go with something a little bit better, but they don't always conform to making the clips for your clinic perfect. So sometimes you make do, and we get fortunate, and then sometimes the talent takes over. Right, so side pick and roll, hopefully, that gives people some appreciation for side pick and roll, the flow, the continuity, not all the coverage solutions, but some uh, next spacing um, for the one of like, just to keep it moving um, and try to get through as much as we can. Shape pick and roll for us. So now corner, corner, pick and roll, where you can basically see Dion now and another person high and wide on the 45. Normally target, or well, in fact, always target player. So in this case, Dion, and the five man involved in the shake, almost always. The other three players could be in any of the spots we would still consider it to be shake, pick and roll. On this one here, you see that it's a show and one, you're gonna see a very good job on the reject, setting it up and then perfect coverage solution on show, pick and roll. Right, so set up. Bang, there's the show, the messy pass ahead. The reason the messy pass means the pass to the two high, right? So the two side, one, two, and this is the two high. The reason we want to do that is it isolates the backside tag. He, he has to become the helper now on Isaac and no one can really X for him. The person would be Marnie, 
And this is very hard for him to do because he's just guarded the ball. And most players, including our own, even when we practiced it, would continually fuck this up. And I almost guarantee that if any team tried this against us and they haven't practiced this as, as much as we had, they would fuck it up because we practiced it a lot and we still couldn't do it. So if they just talked about it once in a meeting, it's not happening. They're forgetting for sure. So we, I mean, and, and later there's like more about show, pick and roll and, and, and it's available to you. First look on this is quick swing. Is the person who was in help late getting out of help? In this instance, he is quick swing. This is the first look, right? This is kind of the baby's crew. Same thing, shape, pick and roll, show, messy pass. This time, this man's sprinting out of help. Dion lay into help. And we've got the high, low diagonal on the rim. Next option, shape, pick and roll eventually, twist. Okay, now shape, pick and roll. Tohi, brilliant passer. So there's the show, messy pass to the too high. Romero should be on diagonal roll. He does a pretty good job of this. This is the backside tag we were trying to isolate. That's who Tohi should look at. Is he in? Then it's skip. Is he out? We make the pass we just saw and hit Romero on the rim. In this instance, he helps in. There's the skip. There's the shot. And one thing that's been kind of cool is to see this translate into preseason for Tohi and his next team. Not to say that Tohi learned it with me. He is a very, very smart basketball player and a great passer and was before he played for us for Saints, but it's cool to see things translate. One of the things in this is you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, uh, because if you deny the sh the messy pass, this is going to be an even better shot for us because the counter to if you deny the messy pass is to throw the short roll to the big at the elbow and then cut and slide. And the person responsible for defending that cut is the same person who's denying the messy pass. And if they deny the messy pass, there's no way they're going to deny the cut. This one here, Marnie's not denying the messy pass. We wouldn't do that. This does, I don't think it makes sense. But if anyone did, there's no way he's getting to this cut. It's impossible. This is going second side. So this is what we're talking about when we say, the five mans ahead, we throw the four cook and go through the trailing big. In this instance, Tohi. Right, Kuhn's done a bad job. This was something that was a continual battle with him, was to get him ridiculously athletic and fast to sprint to corners. As I said, he was the fan at the star of a lot of film sessions. Right, so now we're talking I think that we pass this. Ah, I understand. So this has gone wing to middle pick and roll. Middle pick and roll, they go under, twist into shape. Shape pick and roll, they go under, twist into middle pick and roll. So here's middle pick and roll in our flow. They steal an under, that's a twist. And one of the things that we, we didn't really like Pull up threes off the dribble and not high percentage shots. There's maybe about 12 people in the NBA who shoot them at a rate that is efficient enough that if that was the shot you took every position, you would win the NBA championship. So all these people taking pull up threes off the dribble, this is a losing shot for most players. Uh, it's really a shot you only want to take late shot clock or if you're ridiculously open. So we wanted, this was not a strength for our Saints team. We led the league in three-point percentage. I come into the season thinking that maybe shooting would be a problem for us. It proved not to be an issue. But part of that is by heavy regulation of shot selection. And we tried to avoid taking pull-up threes. And we had a lot of things that we had in place to try to avoid this shot. But we would let them shoot pull-up threes on the twist. So if you go under the first one, and then you go under the second one, well, you had such a prelude and a, and a prediction uh, that they're going to go under and so it's much easier so if Ezra tried to shoot this three versus the first under he might get caught by surprise he'd have to rush his footwork might be a hard shot but when he twists this and gets it to shape pick and roll and you can see him calling Romero to come and get him to stay true with the shape pick and roll spacing because if you don't go middle to shake right we've set our spacing for Ezra to have space to come off to this way. And if you twist it on the spot, he will run right into the wall help of Kerwin. So he gets it away 
back out to the sideline. So the twist now has exit space and Kilwin should get to his left, he kind of does. They go under again. This time Ezra knew it was coming. His feet, he's ready, right? And this is an easier shot. Shake, pick and roll. They switch it, right? So this is, we talked about keeping the flow, going second side. So a lot of teams would stop and try to play the switch immediately, but we wanted to keep the flow. So Dion can hit Tohib, it's not great angle. He makes the messy pass. Dane can look at that high low. It's not available that Dane Brooks is battling it a little bit. So we go second side, back to the middle, KT, right? He's not a pick and roll player. So he's not gonna, the, this is a secondary pick and roll for us. The middle pick and roll is the primary pick and roll. So on secondary pick and roll, we're not trying to make the world of it. It has to be gold and especially for a non-target player. So if KT gets like an under and he can shoot this with him at 49%, certainly we'll consider that. If he can turn the corner, go in and make an easy layout, by all means he can do that. But he is not trying to make complex pick and roll reads here. That's beyond his skill set at this time. He may get there with work, but he's not ready. So keeps it simple, ball back to the middle, ball back to the target player, and now what you might have forgot to look at while we were talking about all this thing, and this is exactly what happens, is Dane Brooks was fighting. And when it went second side, he relaxed and he stopped fighting. And now when it came back to the middle, so he's able to establish good position. And meanwhile, we had this massive post advantage, but you can see that everyone on their team is worried about action, right? They're not all standing there where we stagnantly trying to throw it into the post and they all get ready to help and steal the lob pass. They're all distracted by the flow and it's a straight one-on-one -on -one post up in the paint. Denim comes, but he's far too late. We lose advantage here with a bad pass, miss the shot, jams, offensive rebounds, right? Straight back into no one spacing. This is a brilliant job by Dion, right? Romero sets the pick to the wrong side. Right, so this is a bad job by Romero. He's going to run what we call spread pick and roll. This is something we want to avoid at basically all costs. It's not a good spacing for us. It's a good spacing for Damian Lillard, but it's not a good spacing for us. So he would just run into this help and there would be no advantage. So Dion has two choices here. He can get Romero to flip and run it the other way to his left. So it's middle pick and roll, or he can reject and turn this into shakes. In this instance, he rejects to get it to shakes. Romero follows. And now Dion has space to come downhill into where Josh Aitchison, if he chooses to help, will surrender a kick out three. He chooses not to help, and it's easy downhill layout. Zico, just out of just for clarity purposes, can you just um just define the middle pick and roll spacing? What is the so ideal middle on, pick and roll spacing? So on this, if if Romero set this here to Dion's left. Mm. then this will be middle pick and roll spacing. So and both- Where do you want Romero starting? Is he starting at the free throw line on the strong side elbow? It doesn't really, for me, matter where he comes yeah. from, okay. but he sets the screen here with his ass pointing towards the Nuggets. Opposite of Ezra. He want, you want him to be on the side opposite of Ezra to set the Correct. screen. Yeah, okay. So that Dion's going into space, yeah. not into congestion. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, it's the middle pick and roll is the next spacing. Yeah, yeah. Right, shape, pick, and roll. Yeah. Right, we lose advantage. We go to four cooks, swing it, reverse it. This leads us to side pick and roll, or, or like what we would call wing pick and roll. So side pick and roll was with the big high. Wing pick and roll is the, basically the same pick and roll, but the big low. So this is a wing pick and roll. It's a, very, it's a good one to reject. All right, we get the rejection. Tohi on the wheel is a decoy, not really trying to pass it to him, but you still have to mark it, and that opens the kick out to the corner. All right, so four cooks, swing, swing, pass, pick, and roll. I guess we'll call this a show. Short roll. Let's see, obviously, easy shot. And then this one here, I think, like, so for Cook, there's the flare screen because KT's the non-target and, and Kerwin's more of a target player than him. Slip out of it because they're showing. Short roll pass, help, big to big interaction, lob. We can get to four Cook off of Shake. So if we have Shake, we messy ahead and we don't develop something, 
right? We don't go to it immediately. We can go into the second side interaction. And in some ways, in this instance, you know, they've obviously switched. There's reasons why this can be true. One, if Isaac, he's not really a post threat, but if he was, sometimes you get caught with the guard so obsessed with that, that he's wrestling it. But Isaac's not a post player and you'll notice someone who really plays his role so well. Rolls, he's not posting at all. He gets out to the dunker immediately. That's his job. To, we're not going to post you up, so don't even try. If you do, you're just hurting us. And what that does is open Selby enough. And he's also a point guard on help. So we've removed their biggest help defender and put him 23 feet from the basket. Now we get the maestro pass and there's no one down there who can really deal with Tuki. All right, second side action, flare, cut through. Now we've got that low position for the pick and roll like we wanted. Right, come off. They have to, they sink, right? This is a secondary pick and roll, so we're not making everything of it. If they commit everything to play the secondary pick and roll, then that set us up for the main pick and roll. So Dion doesn't try to make too much of it. He hits the other target player back at the top. Timing not great here. Ezra maybe has high low to Tohi who he misses, and Romero could be up and should be up earlier. But now middle pick and roll. Romero has gravity with his rolls. Sam Timmons doesn't want to leave him. So Ezra is able to get downhill for a layup. Shake, pick and roll, ahead, second side, back to the middle, primary, uh, secondary pick and roll. We're not trying to make everything of it. We've set you up for the middle pick and roll, back to the middle. Eight, and then obviously this backside read is Tom Vodanovich helping. I sell lies, Dion sells this with his eyes and his body language that he's going backside to Leon. Leon can shoot, credit to Leon being in the right position and having done the work to have gravity. Tom Vodanovich is leaving to deal with that and that opens the lob to the interior. Shake, pick and roll again. Second side, pass, pick and roll. Secondary pick and roll, they go under. So yes, Kuhn could shoot it, but we don't really want pull up jumpers. Back to the middle, back to middle pick and roll. Nikal McCullough into gentleman's stance. So gentleman's stance after you, Dion. He's already given the advantage to Dion, so Tohi doesn't need to screen him. He can head start and get in behind Caleb Mullins here. Mullins has obviously head to help to the ball. That pulls DeAndre Daniels in. Dion reads the backside corner. Is he in? Yes, it'll be skip. And when Tohi breaks the free throw line, Deshaun Knight is now a take two defender, right? DeAndre Daniels has help on the roll. Deshaun Knight has Kerwin and, and Dane. If New Zealand was better tactically, you would get lots of full but fill behind passes. But because we have work to do, we found that with our fill behind to the top, almost always got marked. This is a mistake. It makes the kick out pass to the corner three, which is an easier pass and an easier shot wide open. But that's what we found happened. Kuhn was very good at remembering to make this fill behind and he would almost always pull the take two defender with him. And now it's basically three on three. And then there's the easy kick out decision for Dion for the shot. Zico, there's a couple of questions I have from um, before that I want to make sure we um, raise. And I think you started to allude to a few of them as you've been talking. Um, so it might be a good time to just address them quickly. One was um, you started talking about your distaste for the pull up three. Um, and, and obviously, you know, being you being a very strong three point shooting team, um, also a very strong two point shooting team. Um, can you just very quickly talk about um, your uh, shot selection sort of rules, maybe particularly for the team um, and including, you know, we do have a people asking just generally about mid range, your view about mid range. And I know you've spoken about this in a few other places, so I don't, you don't necessarily need to belabor it, but, but maybe quickly just, yeah. What was the shot selection philosophy for the team, given you're running pick and roll, you're getting lots of threes and you're getting lots of quality twos. So first 18 seconds of the shot clock, we want a layup or catch and shoot three for a good shooter. Last six, six, six seconds of the shot clock, we want an open shot. Mm. And then, you know, we're going to show discretion and multiple triggers and crack the ice, shatter the ice, you know, and keep working you until we 
meet our threshold. We're not going to bail you out. And then a little bit with your target players, have a little bit of discretion. So Dion, Kerwin, and Ezra, a little bit of uh, license to shoot paint pools, but they have to be purposeful, right? You're really only shooting the paint pool to deal with two coverages. One is peel switching where they run on, so you beat them off the dribble and they come to help and the person who is marking you leaves you to go mark someone else and they, they leave you wide open in the mid range. So if they're going to try to do that to us, to our target players, then you can take the paint pool. It's now a wide open 13 footer. Um, and it's the antidote to that coverage, it's basically to try to constrain them so they don't use it. And then the other reason is if they're going to play super deep drops and you'll see um, as we progress forward, Dion make a couple of paint pools. Cool. Great second side, pass, pick and roll, great jab step. Secondary pick and roll, Reese bag helps, right? And now, right, they switched initially and now Dion gets a close out to attack against a big, right, who's sunk in. This one here is side pick and roll, flare, they switch back to the middle. Dion chooses to boomerang it back to exploit that switch. Auntie tries to sink downhill the turtle. Dane, as a competent shooting big, is separated out on what I you know, sometimes talk about. Daniel Johnson is very good at this for Adelaide, of coming back up into middle pick and roll and then separating out for the three. And then they're in dominoes, right? And it's an easy kick kick sequence. Second side pick and roll on, on, on the Rio. The dad deny it back to the top. That puts us immediately in flash read. And then obviously we don't make the shot, but it's kind of disappointing. Not because obviously it would be nice to make the shot at that time, but more because it's a really nice position of team basketball that obviously would be kind of fun if it ended in a made shot. But I don't think it detracts from the fact like kick out extra. Right. And in many ways, like we talked about this in a timeout, like Hawks Bay obviously is switching a lot and to shorten the passing distances. This is a terrible switch. Like KT's not really going to run, pick and roll. Look at how easily they give the switch. There's no real reason to give it so easily. Devon Walker could have blown that up very easily, but they, they switch. And this is in some ways the downside of being a team that's like, oh, we'll just switch, we'll just switch, we'll just switch, but not necessarily with quality, just lazy switching. And now they lazy switch where they really shouldn't. This pass would normally go back to Dion, but that becomes a long high-low to Dane. Barcelona is very good at this, but it's just a long pass. So going through the flash read, two short passes to set up the high-low. Mm -hmm. And also the pass to the other big tends to eliminate the the other big is a help defender because vague comes with the pass and now two short passes high low mm -hmm. and you know it's not by fluke you can see if you watch dion he sees it the whole time he's pointing throw it to tohi also puts it us in our best passer decision makers hands uh, middle pick and roll one thing this is just to show a coverage solution doesn't necessarily apply to middle pick and roll, downhill to under. If people are going to go under, the very first thought process is to downhill it, not accept it. It's still a foot race to the other side of the screen. If I go faster with a north angle, I have a better angle than you. You're going to see this go very north and Dion put the NOS on and he still beats whoever that is on the ball and draws the foul, right? Like because Isaac shifts the pick, you see this is a poor quality under. Right, you don't want to go from gap to under, you should go from body on to under. Otago does a poor quality under, so Isaac sees it early, and you'll see he'll shift the screen. So now the Otago player has to take a deeper route on the under. So now Dion's got the straight line and he's got to curve to come under the pick. And obviously, now he's probably slower than Dion, and he's also taking a longer route. So he's going to be late, and we're able to get downhill on the rim. And I think sometimes people think like a clip that shows a foul, oh, that's not as good. That's the best. Like that's the best that 
getting to the foul line is the most efficient scoring. They're the best clips. If you can create a situation to get a foul, it doesn't look as good, but it is great. This is one of the ones we talked about where this is where, you know, Romero coming in, setting the pick and roll the wrong way, spread pick and roll. And you can see the 18 year old point guard knows what's going on and tells the import how to play basketball properly and points him to flip the pick so he can come to the space. And then obviously that opens up opportunities for kickouts. This is another one. You'll see how deliberate Dion's become about setting his spacing. It's a bad camera angle, but shake, pick and roll under. He sets it up, bang, right back to middle pick and roll, right? He doesn't just twist it on the spot. Shake becomes middle and rescreens, twists are great ones to reject. Here's that principle we talked about, about shooting against the second under. So shake pick and roll under, Kewen sets it up, back to middle. They go under again. Now he knows it's coming. Not surprised, easy shot. One of the things that like you kind of talked about, I think something along the lines of sets. So part of our thought process was we installed the spacings and we learned the spacings in preseason and we smashed the coverage solutions. So we went to preseason with flow, one side play and one up play, a baseline out of bounds and a sideline out of bounds. And then our imports got out of quarantine the Monday after that preseason, and we played on the Thursday, I think. So we went to our first game with that. That's all we had. Flow, two sets, sideline out of bounds, baseline out of bounds. That's all we had to play Nuggets. Because I, I didn't feel like it made sense to have all this in, but the two imports are not there. Let's learn everything together, not superficially, do it properly with all the main components but let's know what we're gonna do extremely well. And all our sets were either middle pick and roll sets or shake pick and roll sets or a couple of side sets or a few post-up plays. So every play that we call is coming back predominantly to middle pick and roll or shake pick and roll. So if we know middle pick and roll very well, or we know shake pick and roll very well and the coverage solutions, we can put in sets now coming back to a known spacing that we've been working on since day one. So you will see this is this play here was the first play we put in, the first set we put in and we took to preseason and we took to the opening games. And you can see like, I'm sure to an opposing team, this is gonna look like really complicated. And I'm sure if I've got you to watch this now and see draw up what they just did, if you were scouting us and you had to watch this live, you Jesus Christ. There's like just people running everywhere and then fuck, they scored. It would not be easy. But for us, this is very easy. For all of the movement, hopefully you will see, because I'm pointing it out, it's going to end in middle pick and roll. And then we just go to middle pick and roll solutions. So this play here starts with a zipper entry, right? A touch, and then everyone's in movement, right? And this is practice when we first putting it in. This is, I think, day one for this play, for this play. So, right, so everyone's in movement. There are purposes to this movement. But at this point here, this is basically, again, guess timing. This is middle pick and roll spacing. So for Dion, he's still got all the exact same reads, middle pick and roll. So they've shown in middle pick and roll, Tuki's open. Who's the low man? Kale Robinson is the low man. That's who Dion needs to look at. Is he helping? No. Pass it on the rim. Same thing in game. Right? So this is the same play with everyone in the same spots too, I think. Right? It's a middle pick and roll play. All the movement has purpose. You can talk about it a little bit, right? If you play middle pick and roll, Generally, the two, like if you think middle pick and roll, Danny's going to end up in this front side corner. So that puts the four man ahead and removes the biggest help side defender. There's going to be a backside corner, which is going to be Kenneth, who's going to fill that late just by nature of the touch, but it's a good thing he'll be late. And Kerwin's running a loop back into this 45. 
most teams help off KT in this situation, off the backside corner, but he's high at the moment and he's filling late. There's a really good chance Tom Cowie is not going to recognize that he's the help defender. And the point guard on this hard loop, he's the other person who could help, but when point guards go on hard loops, opposing point guards normally think they're looping hard to get the ball back. So he chases himself off his own help side, right? So you notice Tom Cowie hasn't recognized that he's the low man. He should be right in the charge circle right now. And Courtney Belger hasn't recognized it either. And this player is designed to open the role. Zico, quick question. Um, and I think it's um, it's it's really cool to see kind of this evolution, right? In the sense, you've got your known your known spacings, you've got this sort of like skeleton structure that the players get super deep on in terms of mastering, you know, middle shake pick and rolls, and then kind of adding in and layering this complexity in terms of some of these sets with lots of movement that that returns players to these core kind of spacings. I guess the question was, and I think DC's got a good one around when you're as you're introducing this material to the team, um, how much five on five are you playing? How much live basketball are you playing? Um, and then my other question is, how long did, would you say it actually take took you to get the players to the point where they really had a, the depth of understanding that you wanted of your known sort of spacings and reads out of, uh, out of the middle and shape pick and roll? How long I would say day two of preseason. Huh. So, yeah, well, we went to day two of preseason and we had that talk in the morning. From that point on, the season pretty much flowed downhill on court, off court, injuries. Yeah, right. <laughs> players not able to come in, all sorts of things. But on court, pretty much flowed, flowed downhill from there. Uh, yeah. Five like, on five? Did you, how much five on five? How much five on five? Almost all. Yeah. So we would, say like put in a play teach the play teach how to market correctly and then play yeah cool um we we probably trained more than any other team so we did like two a days four or five times a week for the whole season so we had a lot of time to prepare things so um you know we could we could the the, the, the morning sessions were so there were more like, so I, it was kind of crazy. Like I've done this with all three teams. I've been a head coach for NBL, but with Hawks Bay, we would have maybe six people at individuals in the morning. Mm. We offered it to our Saints squad. We had 21 people in the squad. And the first morning we offered individuals, 19 players showed up and basically continued to show up for the whole season. We'd have 18, 19 people at individuals every day. Mm. So there's obviously too many for individuals. So then I just had to split it into multiple sessions. So I would go in in the morning and run multiple sessions for all the kids. Well, they're not kids. Some of them me and some of them are definitely kids or babies. They would all get their individuals. And then that, that would be working on contextual skills. So we might have like a day where like today's theme is punishing the show out of middle pick and roll. And we're just going to work on that for 50 minutes. And you getting all the skill reps, passing, dribbling, shooting, whatever to be ready for that. And then tonight at practice, you know, we're going to be working on that. So then you come in and apply it in a five on five team context. I mean, that wasn't every day, but that was generally it. And I, I mean, one of us saying it's become like our theme saying for Shimani, the magic is in the work. Uh, and we stole that from Tom Thibodeau, but like, you know, my last two teams have led New Zealand NBL and three point percentage. And just the magic is in the work. Like we've probably shot more than any other team in the league. And it's, you know, by a lot. And therefore we expect to make shots. And I wouldn't say that the Saints team, you know, as I said, one of my worries is maybe we won't shoot it well enough. And then we come out and lead the league in three point percentage, but the players did the work and they knew it. They're like, no one else trains as much as we do. And they don't train like us. And that gave them confidence. You know, obviously it was close at the end. The Hawks Bay very, very talented. That team shouldn't lose to us, but they didn't do the work and disrespected the game. So that is what happens to them. Um, middle pick and roll, roll comes right back into coverage solutions, right? So we show it here. So now short roll and into cut and slide. And I think this is 
very like this may be the first time we put it in like this might be the first position they run at five on five All right so we go side four bang show short roll we already know how to burn the show on middle pick and roll we've got two priority one passes one is the ezra the messy pass priority one a is the short roll to tuhi the pass is not quite accurate and he turns the wrong way because of that but and immediately they're into their cut and slide. Matariki needs to get down on this cut. He doesn't in time and the layup. And you're going to see exactly the same thing here. All right, middle pick and roll, show, short roll, cut and slide. There's the layup. Uh, this one is first play of preseason. Right, we had this one in. They overhelp. We can see it's middle pick and roll spacing. They help off the high tag, kick back. There's Ezra for three. Fitch did one of the better jobs of marking this play um, by getting into push coverage on the middle pick and roll. Um, and he worked it out pretty quick, which was, which was good. Uh, what is this now? Okay. Uh, this is a little part about how important it is to reject pick and rolls. I, if people have to go, I understand. But if you like it, stay. I'll just keep going until we're finished or you guys cut the zoom off. We'll see what comes. I keep going, keep going. Um, reject pick and roll. It's all spacings really emphasize to your players to reject the pick and roll for real. Like if you can reject it and create a domino situation, this is the best thing. If they cut it off, it's the perfect setup to come back and use the pick and roll. So reject on side pick and roll. If you beat the man, it's a nice juicy layup. Right, so you'll see here, side pick and roll. Zach's a really good defender. It takes a little bit more work to get by him, but Dion eventually gets there and then makes an all-world kick-out pass. I mean, Kerwin makes a really good cut here, right? So he, this is because it's side pick and roll. If we would get the ball to the baseline off a pocket pass or a reject, then it's an automatic 45 cut because Dante's going to have to help. Taki, I think it is, is going to have to drop as the take two and then bang right down that scene he goes Taki gets kind of frozen and Dion makes very good ice cell lies and basically fast falls it and there's Kerwin and ah, KT sitting in his corner ready to shoot 49 percent second side back to the middle footwork to reject the pick and roll mm -hmm. And do you feel that way in almost every pick and roll that reject is really perfect? almost every, every one, but if you're going like two hit combo or like there's one set that's, I don't think we show it in these clips, but is it like an arrival pick and roll? Mm. The first pick and roll is the setup. And when you catch, it should be catch and rip. And to do a reject would just buy them time to reestablish the defense. But if it's the first pick and roll, then yes. And even a middle pick and roll when even a middle pick and roll when the reject leads you to the side where you've got a, a, a teammate on the strong side. I mean, one, you're gonna see that you can get that. We've already seen it once where Dion yeah. twisted against Otago, the bad baseline camera angle, and then got the straight line reject. Mm, he right. has to do a very good job on his ball pick up to split the gap, but this is something that he understands better than I do. He sends me the clips and he's got them tagged and he's got notes all about the type of pickup he did and the footwork and all that. It's very good for my learning as a coach um, to understand some of the details that he's putting into making it work. Um, but yeah, it's not quite as good to get the actual reject, but for one, the, the person marking you doesn't necessarily need to know that you're not actually going to take it. Yeah. Like a lot of times the shrink help is in his behind that player, him or her. And often we'd love it if they were talking extremely well, but often they're not. We all know this. So a lot of times if I attack at the shrink help, that person will still cut it off because they think they have to. And it turns out I was just tricking them but I've got their momentum going the wrong way and now I have separation to come back. Um, but you'll see on this next clip, so this is side four again, 
or not side four again, not as a play call. This is side four again in the video. But you'll see on this one, Dion gets that same. So it comes back to middle pick and roll, as we spoke about. Bang, there's all the movement. And same footwork that he just basically used the other way. And as we spoke about, this, this, this I wouldn't expect to happen very often. Like it's not, as you're saying, it's not a great one to reject. But this speaks to the power of Ezra's loop or whoever's making it, right? Like I think it's Sam Smith in a position where he could easily wall help this, but he's so obsessed with the loop that he chases himself right past Dion going down the middle. Uh, is it Smith? Maybe Jack Exeter. <laughs> ah, this is the play, but we fuck it up. So this play here is designed for to get a rip pick and roll. So this one I wouldn't uh, reject without going into all the specifics. This play here is to prevent push coverages. So if you're trying to push kill and left, we're going to get him to his right. Uh, so bang. Now Canterbury bails them. They're in trouble here, but they bail themselves out by going under. And in this instance, we miss the twist. So he overrolls it and we have nothing. But as we said, if we fuck up execution, we can always come right back to a known spacing. And I think you'll find there's a good, I can't see the shot clock, it's behind the zoom overlay, but it looks like maybe 19 even on the shot clock. So we go straight to second side, back cut's not on. We wouldn't go through with the handoffs if it was going to be heavily contested. It doesn't make sense. We would just go back to the middle. So KT tries to back cut it into space, out to space with the same sprint, back to the middle, till he back into middle pick and roll. And now we get the reject. Is it fair to say that the vast majority of kind of, if your initial pick and roll doesn't create an advantage, uh, ultimately you're gonna end up coming back to another pick and roll, like in terms of how the team played? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, in terms of just for a second, so a lot of people would talk coverage solutions and, um, you know, with coverage solutions against the show. Ross and I have already done like a, yeah. what we felt was like a very comprehensive um, clinic on that. Uh, where we basically tried to think of basically everything we could possibly think of. So we didn't quite get everything, but we got a lot and that's freely available. So I've just put the link in the chat. So if people are wanting to know about coverage solutions against the show, that's already there for everyone. So I'm not gonna cover that now because if you're really interested, that's there for you and you can watch it. Um, but so now uh, what we're gonna show a little more is um, against the drops. Right, drops is a little bit more technical and not as tactical as the aggressive coverage. Um, but I think it's important for the players to have a, a really clear understanding of the progression, the options that are available to them. So first reject versus drops versus anything. Reject's even better against aggressive coverage. The big's completely out of the play now, but it's good against drops too. Okay, you've tried to reject, wasn't available, they've contained it, but hopefully now you have good separation, they're not body on, and so you're starting to the win the battle coming downhill. So the first thing the guard is thinking is downhill, go get a layup. Big is thinking put pressure on the rim, get two on one pressure, try to get behind the rock, the, the defender, right? And this one, Dane Pops is a second priority option for us, but we're first thinking get downhill, right? As we said, drawing fouls is a great thing. All right, this is out of another set play, All right? Three pick and rolls to set the main pick and roll up. And you can see, right? Like, so this is a play that you use, especially if you're attacking a big, big, so not really Nick Barrow per se, but like Alex Pledger, you shift them one way, you shift them the other way, you shift them the other way, and they don't like to shift that much. So the first two pick and rolls are mostly fake, right? So Troy off pick and roll, but he does a great job. He turns the corner. 
So for all intents and purposes, Huskies have to play this as a true pick and roll. They can't tell it's a fake because Troy's turned the corner and now he's going to touch it. Bang. Second pick and roll that Nick Barrow has to mark. KT looks a little turn of the corner. Nick has to shift across. Also, Justin Bibbs has got into shrink help. So now when we touch it back to our target player for the real pick and roll, look at the separation Dion has with Bibbs. And Nick Barrow's already had to shift one way and then back another way. And now he's going to have to move a third time. And now we have the advantage and it doesn't happen for them. Uh, downhill snake, won't talk about that much. Eventually, Kuhn can pass the ball. All right, chase over on this. So the next person in some ways, when, this is middle handoff more than pick and roll, but we would make virtually the same right reads on middle handoff. And so one of the first people who can help on this is a high tag. So Danny's going to become the fill behind. And you're going to see McKay, thinks he's a tough guy, wants to bump the roller. Right, so Dion's looking at him. Okay, you're going to high tag. Here's Danny on the fill behind. We miss it a little bit with the accuracy of the pass, but it doesn't matter. This is a set, right, in scouting. When Hawks Bay would play drop coverage, they would always come off the low tag. So the players had seen this in the video. We had practiced it and building up throughout the week, getting them ready for this pass. And Dion coming off, we lose advantage. The refs eight seconds into the game decide to miss their first foul call of the game. Um, this great job by them. But Dion knows where he's looking when we get into this rescreen. And, and so he's looking basically knowing that Hiram will come in the help. All right, so he knows that Hiram's the person to look at because they're a low tag team and Hiram's an over helper. And so he knows that he's looking for Dane on this backside corner. All right, so that position has been building all week, being prepared for it. We don't, well, they do a good job in some ways of putting out a fire, Richie Roger. KT doesn't try to do anything crazy. Just keeps it simple. Back to middle pick and roll. All right, low tag help by Jeremy McKay. There's the kick out. There's the catch and shoot three. Right, and these are all being done, right? So this is why I'm some ways saying like it's metronomic, right? Dane is just sitting back in that corner and taking easy catch and shoot threes. This is someone who I think like his career high, he's a young player, but his career high percentage coming into this season was like 26% or something on threes. And then when they write a big article for him, it was like 47%. And I think it settled in somewhere in the mid forties for the season. And I don't know if Dane really became a better shooter. We cleansed all the bullshit. No more step back, difficult shots, degree of difficulty. So many people play basketball, including in New Zealand, like the, you would swear there are degree of difficulty points. You'd be like, oh man, is that, if you knew nothing, and you just came in and watched a game for the first time, you'd be like, oh man, what he attempted must be worth 12 points. You know, no, it's worth the same as that easy shot that guy just said. Well, why the fuck would you do that then? You know, I swear you would think a lot of the coaches and their development workouts, a lot of the players think that there are a degree of difficulty points. They're not. All right, so our goal is to generate as many easy points, easy shots as we can and be ruthlessly efficient about finding those efficient shots. It is nice when you have someone like Dane who can make some hard plays so that if it gets down to the end of the shot clock and you need to be bailed out, you've got someone who's capable of doing it, but it's nice to have. It's like the karate kid on the boat. When do I fight? Or why am I learning to fight so you don't have to fight? Like you got it, so you don't have to use it. As opposed to I've got all these crazy shots that I can make at a decent percentage and I'm going to try to do it early in the shot clock. Um, that doesn't make sense. So it makes it easy, right? What does Dane need to work on in player development? He needs to spot up in these backside corners and be ready to shoot 45% on these threes. Because you can see time and time again, he's the recipient of these kick out shots. They go under, we twist it, bang, middle pick and roll. Gentleman stance, get downhill on the rim, put pressure, Dante helps, there's the early kick, and there's KT sitting down in that corner being ready. Offensive boards, kick out, right back to pick and roll, not great spacing here. Backside help by Ruben, kick out, catch and shoot. 
shake pick and roll. The help comes generally from the backside and drops, right? Tuhi out early, Jaden Bazant pulls in. And these are things we're working on all the time in player development, all these hook passes. Bang, there's the shot. Right into our jams and people do dumb shit. Quick, quick one, because um, I know there were a few questions in this uh, and there was definitely a, at least one question. Um, in your experience working with teams that don't have enough shooting, or or maybe you have you you or you your roster suggests that I have to play a certain number of players. Maybe two of my better players are actually non-shooters, and I need to play them together. <clears throat> Can you maybe like speak to the coaches who are dealing with teams that where they don't have the you know you know four shooters around the ball, or or just don't have enough shooting? So one, I would say is the positions that they play, mm -hmm. right? Like if you've got a non-shooter, they better be good enough to be your target player. So mm -hmm. in our instance, the person who's running the pick and rolls, but for you, it might be the isolations or the post-ups, whatever the triggers are. And the other one better be able to play the five. There really isn't a place for role-playing non-shooters. They have to be extremely clever to compensate. Dylan Boucher, Mika Vakona, Tony Allen, and even those guys, we just named three people who are exemplars of players who overcame their non-shooting ability. Mm. They've all been retired for six years or so, give or take, mm. or at least the peaks of their careers. So that was archetype that they made work, but it's getting less and less workable. Mm. Um, so is to a degree, there's not a place for non-shooting, non-target players who don't play the five. Yeah. Right? So you you got to fix it or you better become a target player or you better work out how you're going to grow to be a five a five man. And, and, and that's the trends of basketball are suggesting that it's going to become even less place for them. Mm. Um, so there is that. Um, you can play a little bit more two screeners and you'll see that that we played with two screeners where you see when we go four cook, the four man is pick and rolling, then the five man is pick and rolling. Right. And you can have them short. And the, but, but as I said, to compensate for that, they have to be very smart, very good at spacing the floor, and they have to be tremendous interior passes. Yeah. Yeah. If you had a young player, it's probably easier just to teach them how to shoot than it is to teach them how to be extremely smart, extremely good at spacing the floor and an extremely good interior passer. If they happen to already be that kind of player, then maybe you can make it work. Um, obviously, you could talk about it yeah. so much yeah, more. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you see here, the fill behind, right? So high drops, right? In this instance, both Canterbury defenders kind of tag fill behind. So if Tuhi, if they low tag this from Sam Smith, and then I think this is Mason Whitaker becomes the take two defender, then if Tuhi stays here, Mason Whitaker can kind of sit between them, and he can make it hard for Dion to work out who he should pass the ball to. The fill behind stretches, like medieval torture rack, stretches the take two defender. So if Tuhi goes to the midline, now the take two for Mason Whitaker is from Tuhi on the cursor to whoever's sitting in this backside corner, right? So that's very hard for him to cover all that distance. And he'll make his choice and then it will be a very easy pass for Dion because it will be very obvious which one he's chosen to defend and who is open. So the fill behind this is a very easy thing. It's extremely valuable and very, very frequently not done. You, know, you tell the players and you end up reminding them, fill behind, fill behind, fill behind. You have to drill it a lot and you have to film it and you have to show them when they forget and do whatever you can to get them to do it. And we, as I said, like Kerwin was not always the best with his tactics. He was very coachable and this is something that he did understand and he was very good at these. But in this instance, the first one is you're filling behind potential for shot. We miss it here, but it's just a good example for fill behind. Also leads, it's a very good one to fill behind into drive. So for Cook, this is the babies playing the garbage minutes. I think one of the ways 
if you're trying to work out if you think someone's a well-coached team or not, go watch their bench play. If it looks kind of the same as the starters, this is probably a good indicator. Right, so middle pick and roll, high tag by Dane Brooks, fill behind, road runner by a driver, and Kale was able to get a layup. Middle pick and roll, high tag, fill behind, took him middle drive, lob. What happens on this one? Ah, just general kickouts. If they, they shouldn't come off the front side, but sometimes they do. They deny a sideline out of bounds, kind of messes us up. We come right back to shape, pick and roll, over help off the corner, kick out. Kickouts are priority one passes. Teams generally help and collapse, like that's what they've been taught to do so that since they were little kids, so you have to establish the kick out and the shooting, then they might expand and the rim will open up. This is the same clip, the flip, the collapse, the kick out, the catch and shoot. Same again, shape, pick and roll, kick out. Now it puts them in closeouts, dominoes. into a set, touch it, shape, pick and roll, uh, jump, is this jump pass? No, downhill, drive it, dominoes, kick out. Next option after the kickouts, as I said, priority one, we have to establish the kickouts, is the lob. So now Dion's coming off, Isaiah Moss is not helping, or he's late. Obviously it helps if you have 7-2, you put it in a position that they can't make a play, but it doesn't have to be 7-2. This is this play that we talked about. So the week before where we got all the way through the pick and rolls and it came back to Dion, he got downhill on Barrow. This time along the way, bang on this touch, Kuhn makes this one real. We turn the corner, gentleman stance for Tuhi. Taki Ferentz is surrendered like after you. So Tuhi doesn't need to screen him anymore. He gets out early. And now it's lob. And even if it doesn't lead to, so press break, this is what I kind of mean by no one spacings, press break, two, two, one press, broken, hit the trail, straight into four cook. No one spacing, 16, 17 seconds in the shot clock, we've broken the two, two, one, and we're straight into our offense. Back to the middle, 14 second shot clock, and we're into our main play, middle pick and roll. Hit gentleman stance, Head start by Tuhi. This time doesn't have to be for a dunk. Obviously understanding that <coughs> some of you will have shorter bigs or female bigs that they can't get an alley-oop dunk, but they can still catch a high pass for a high finish. For Cook, back to the middle. <coughs> this is a snap action where Ramirez gonna go in. So pick and roll, Waterman shows. So now, He's out of position to show a game, puts him in drops, whether he wanted to be or not, lob. Sorry. <coughs> we get tested all the time. I can assure you I'm negative. Um, Smurf, so <laughs> you drive and you don't have to finish on the big. So we don't want Dion to throw up some shit on Timmons and it's try to score on the seven footer. Some people call it Nash, some people call it Midget, some people call it Smurf. Here in Japan, we call it Mazito because they don't know what the Smurfs are, but they know the translation for Midget. <laughs> so going under, right? So you don't have to bail out. Lift off the corner. In this instance, okay, we don't really, we lose advantage. It takes Tohi a little bit of time to recognize, but he comes sprinting back into a side pick and roll and then jump pass. Right, so this pass is like not probably as frequent, but it is one of the ways you beat the drops. So Dion's gonna jump, but he's not, there's a difference, right? The old saying like, don't jump to pass, don't jump to make a decision. He's already decided what he's gonna do before he jumps. So he's jumping to really sell the fake to Timmons and then dropping the bounce pass under his hands. And this opens the roll. So this is the same play, Danny's on the wrong side, and this is where we talked paint pulls. So they're in a drop, 
right? This is where the target player has a little bit of license just to keep them honest. And you will see this play here. So this play here we call Chico, right? Which I mean, if you're from California, I'm sure you probably I do. know enough Spanish to know what Chico means, <laughs> right? Little boy. So this is a play that we're running to target the weakest perimeter defender. In this case, the little boy is Daron Rokawa. We're going to attack him. So we run it opposite him. And now when Kuhn looks like the same play you've seen time and time again up until now, this is good. We want it to be disguised. Now Kuhn, instead of passing it back and going middle pick and roll, is going to follow in and set a hard pick because we're trying to bait them into switching. If they won't switch, Dion will have downhill because Ethan won't be able to mark it particularly well. But they take the bait of the switch. And now what we've done is they're trying to hide Darone away and put him on the weakest player, often on KT or Troy. And we want Darone to have to mark our target player. So they've taken the bait now and switched. We could isolate, but in this instance, we go into shake, pick and roll. Darren drops. You can see the separation Darone surrenders. So he's not a good pick and roll defender. So he's giving a lot of separation. And because he's small, even though he tries to late contest, he really can't do much about Dion, who's probably six inches taller, getting down into the paint with the little paint pool. So this is a much harder shot for Dion if he has to do it against Devondra Walker. Right, another set, this one here. Um, Knight trying to cheat, Deshaun, bang, into middle pick and roll. This is something that we really de-emphasize with our team, mainly to put pressure on Dane and Tohi to not take the easy option. They are both very good pick and pop players. If we would given this to them on day one of the season, they probably would have done it all the time and we wouldn't have had the roll. So all those lobs and everything you've seen to Tohi probably wouldn't have happened. So basically he wasn't allowed to pop until maybe 70% of the way through the season. Every now and then he would. He's a very smart player. We had this discussion. It wasn't just trying to trick him. I had exactly the discussion with him, explain the rationale. We want you to develop your role. We can always pop later, right? But you can use pop against drops. And if you pop out a middle pick and roll, you really don't want to pop out of shakes. It's not a good spacing. You pop out of side pick and roll, you pop out of wing pick and roll, you pop out of middle pick and roll. If you pop out of wing, uh, middle pick and roll, then generally, unless they're on full rotations, you cut the pop. So he pops, DeAndre Daniels will become the tag man, and Dane cuts, and now we have a two-on-one advantage. Jaden Bazant stays with the shooter in the corner, so we hit the person on the rim, and Tuhi and Dane work that very, very well. Um, so that's kind of middle pick and roll. I'll just keep going a little bit here and then maybe we have some questions because there's only a couple more clips. Okay. Uh, we talked about the concept of shattering the, uh, crack the ice, shatter the ice. In some ways, we talked about shot threshold. We talked about ruthless pursuit. These may not be the best, best clips for this, but the idea of the discretion. So this one here, Dane kind of goes into his isolation and Sam Gould does a good job. It stays in front. I'd suggest Dane before this year, this shot gets shot, you know? Good job, so I'll just take the really hard shot. He was so good at buying into what we wanted to do. You know, he comes back out, we get back to another pick and roll, second catch, now he's got complete separation, and now he's able to get to a much better, easier shot deeper. All right, you sort of see something similar here. All right, second side. He, gets his zoom going, QB does a good job containing, into the handoff, bang, pick and roll, right? Till he separate away. Maybe we have enough advantage, but we don't, with ruthless pursuit of efficiency. He snaps right back into another handoff action. They try to steal it under, easy catch and shoot three, right? So when people are asking about shot profiles, in some ways, like, Maybe Dion could have thrown some shit up. He could have hit Tuhi and he could have just shot a mid-range too. But we're not taking those shots at 15 or so on the shot clock. Ruthless pursuit of the shots we want. If we keep probing you, you will probably break down. And then if you don't, then we can open things up in the last six seconds of shot clock. So rather than Tuhi throwing up some crap, he goes to another trigger. 
If this one they mark better, then KT throw this straight back to Kerwin. You can see Dion's already respacing, and here would become Dane sprinting into middle pick and roll. They go under. It's a mistake with the 49% three-point shooter. And this, you know, this is the last clip and then can answer questions. But like, and this is built in practice. And this is my favorite play of the whole season. It comes in practice because so many things that we had worked on come together in this play. And it shows intelligence, selflessness, do no harm, buying into your role, you know, and, and Isaac does a great job on this, right? So middle pick and roll. They kind of show it, messy pass, high low, charge circle catch. Now, a lot of bigs would feel compelled to shoot this. Isaac's not a good post player. He struggles to score on guards in the post ups and certainly struggles to score on big seven two player. He shows discretion, he shows intelligence, he shows selflessness. What's coming? He kicks the shit out and goes into another pick and roll, back to another known spacing. If we don't get them on the first one, right, we lose the battle in some ways, but we have another battle. You might win two battles, three battles, but if we beat you in the fourth battle, we win the war, right? So we keep making you mark multiple actions. Sooner or later, you will make a mistake. And we crack the ice with that first one, right? We start to put them out of position. Look at that. Romero thinks he's done his job. He relaxes. He surrenders separation. The first one, he was somewhat in position to show. This one now, he's completely out of position to show. So now when we get to the next pick and roll, he's really out of position. He over-responds in the help and he opens the pocket. And now Isaac does what he does do well, which is New Zealand high school high jump champion right? He, he doesn't have to finish over anyone because the lane is now clear and it shows just great discretion. And so I really love that play because it's so many things that we wanted coming together in one little sequence. Yeah, um, right. So hopefully this gives, you know, people a lot of food, food for thought and hopefully it gives them a lot of things to consider. Um, that they can incorporate in. I know it's not like a foolproof, like here's the solution that is really what you're gonna achieve from any clinic, but hopefully you get lots of ideas. Um, and then, I mean, I know it's coming up 10 there, but still, I mean, it's dark here, but it's still hours to go for me. So um, <laughs> certainly if there's any pertinent questions, then people are more than... Um, there are, there are a few, there are a few, and maybe we can just do a few, uh, throw a few out there and then we can call it a night. Um, I found this fascinating and really, really, really enjoyed um, all of what you've shared. It's given me so much really, really good things to think about personally. Um, Alex has got a question here um, around um, using three on three and four on four. So he's asking to simplify the decision making and repetitions. Would you use three on three or four on four at the under 15 or under 17 age groups? And if so, how would you set things up for different pick and roll situations? We may we may use those things a little bit in individuals and certainly obviously you don't always have your whole team available to you so by nature of those constraints you have to play two on two or three on three sometimes we would scaffold it but i'm not a big fan of three on three or four on four um i mean i hate three x three it's a different sport um it removes almost everything that I like about basketball. Part of the challenge of basketball is that five players is a little bit too many to have on the court. And you have to think, how am I going to create time and space simultaneously to exploit an advantage? And how am I going to move my players and position them? And three on three eliminates that. Um, so I think it has somewhat of a place, but I would prefer to play five on five um two on two for getting like the fundamentals down the rejects the body ons um if you're going to play conservative coverages to work on your coverage your defensive coverage in the two on two but if you're going to work on shows then it basically has to be five on five it doesn't 
work if you play with less players. I mean, defensively, it will corrupt the shows and your players will leave, lose complete faith in their showing, which is not what you want if that's what you intend to do. And also the reds are specific, right? And so many times when you play small-sided games, so much stuff comes up that you end up being like, well, that wouldn't happen because there'd be another person on the court or that spacing's incorrect because there'd be another play person on the court or that's not really realistic. What solves all that is just playing five on five. And then all the reads are exactly the reads. Like, as I said with the thing earlier, there's not enough time to master everything that you'll need to master. So let's start working on it, you know, as, as quickly as possible. Um, so yes, there is some scaffolding, but I think you're trying to get to the point of five on five as quickly as you possibly can, uh, because that's the most specific reads. Like a lot of what we just talked about wouldn't be true in three on three, or it wouldn't be true in four on four. Um, I think three on three probably has more application in four on four because say like shape, pick and roll with the backside corner versus drops to work on reading that backside corner defender that has some application. Um, but yeah, we, we mostly play five on five, which the players want to do anyhow. Yeah. Other questions, Matt? Yeah, I guess kind of building off of, I mean, is there any, you know, you've spent time, I think back to 2012 and Hutt Valley High and, um, everything you showed tonight is, is Saints, which is fantastic. If you were coaching a high school team or, you know, if I was coaching an under 17 team, are there any layers that you would maybe pull back? Would you be thinking about less um, known spacings? What would you be thinking about in terms of um, simplifying, if anything, at a younger age group? I think every team, I kind of discussed this a little bit on slapping glass in the last few weeks with that podcast, but every team you evaluate kind of as its own entity. Like what players do I have relative to the competition we're going to be playing against uh, and, and, and what are we trying to achieve? So if we're trying to win the championship in our respective league, then what teams are going to have to beat to do that? And then from there, you start determining what's the best way for us to play to be maximally successful. That could end up being, so like, it was weird when, say like, the commentators would try and say like, oh, the Hawks, 2019 Hawks, 2021 Saints and make comparisons between them because though there were commonalities, those two teams basically play on completely different ends of the continuum. One is fast paced five out principle based offense and the other one is the slowest paced team three around two extremely prescriptive so why play that way because i felt like the league the way it changed who we were competing against our personnel there was the appropriate approaches for those two teams if 2019 Hawks plays conventional warfare with 2021 uh, with 2019 Saints and Sharks. So they lose badly, you know. So they had to play in a kind of a high variability style to try to make something weird happen to give ourselves a chance. And then, obviously, in the final, it almost does. Like you need something crazy to happen. I mean, I don't think. I thought we we're going to have to play that well just to stay close. And never in our wildest dreams thought that would lead to us having a big lead. But you needed something kind of crazy to happen. And we probably needed us to be hot from three to go with that because of how good Paulie's team was. Um, whereas with this Saints team, we wanted Dion to be able to control everything. We believed he was going to be the best player in the league in the off season. So we wanted to put as much as we could in his basket and then once we got Dane and Tuhi, there was a certain way that made sense to play with those two. And then the likes of KT could be really, really successful in a, in, in, in a little box. He could have a great season. 
and he's only 23, so, you know, and a great work ethic. So and by the time he's 26, 27, we might be talking about a pick and roll player. But at the moment, let's have him have success in his role. Um, so if you say, get now gave me a high school team, under 15 team, I would still start that process, analyzing my team relative to the competition. Will it be simpler? Not necessarily. I, I think like young people are extremely capable of learning things, right? Like if any of the people listening has tried to learn a second language as an adult, it's very, very difficult. I think most people would agree with that. It's not an easy task. So we can deduct from that that learning a language is a difficult thing to do. And yet, almost all of us, probably everyone who's on the chat, at zero to one to two years old, mastered a language. So we're inherently capable of learning very difficult things when we're very young. So if you want to teach your under 15 team how to run Mike D'Antoni's Phoenix Suns offense, they are in, imminently capable of doing that. You will have to do a good job of teaching it, but that's true if you want um, a pro team to be good at running the offense too. Um, and you should aspire to be good at teaching what you teach. So that's the challenge for you as the coach. And then um, you just might have to understand that it might take a little longer because they don't have the prior knowledge. But in some ways, not having the prior knowledge can also help a little bit because you're getting a little bit of a blank slate. So you maybe don't have to fight the prior learning that might contradict what you want. So that can help. Um, would I make it simpler? I think like you have an order of priorities and then you see how they go. So like, I would think about the competition. Let's say we we're gonna play pick and roll. We've already made the determination that I've got the baby 21 Saints and we've decided we're gonna be pick and roll. We're gonna to try to play the same way. So I would think, okay, what coverages are we most likely to see at under 15 level? And then I probably don't know this answer. Some of the coaches probably know it more recently than me, but let's just say for argument's sake, man, we're gonna see shows, everyone under 15 shows. Okay, let's start with show as being in our aggressive coverage. So there's kind of families of coverages, aggressive coverages, traps, shows, switches. Um, these all lie on a continuum. So switch is a bit more towards the middle. Conservative coverages, drops, ice, squee, oh, squee, no, right. Conservative family, zero coverages, under, squeeze, where you kind of zero, where you don't have the big help. So you kind of need a, a proxy for each. So we need to teach our players how to beat an aggressive coverage. And we've determined the most common aggressive coverage we see is show. So that's something we're going to address in the preseason. We're going to learn our principles and way of attacking the show from the spacings that we intend to play. You work on getting mastery of that. You need to teach them how to beat a conservative coverage. So maybe you're like, the most common conservative coverage is drops. So let's learn how to beat the drops coverage from the spacings that we intend to play. And you work on having mastery of that. It might be that, that your team takes till midway through the rep season to get those two things. Okay, you're a slower paced team. You have to accept that. It may be that you've accepted it, but you're still pushing them. It may be that they are like, pick it up really, really quickly. And you can, oh man, we've mastered the switch. We're really, I've uh, mastered the show. We're playing against it great. And we're still in preseason. Okay. The good thing is it gets easier because there's tons of commonalities between the way that you punish the switch, our uh, show, to punish the switch, to punish the trap. So like if they've mastered punishing the show, one of the aggressive family, when they learn to punish the rest of the aggressive family, they're going to start being like, yo, coach, we already know all this stuff. You're like, great, because we know how to beat the show. Well, it turns out, ladies, punishing the switch is really similar. There's a few differences, but there's going to be lots of commonalities. So hopefully they will pick it up more quickly than they did the first time. 
if you're going to, if your goal for the year is to win the championship and it's a noble goal at youth basketball, you know, it's like still a good thing to do, especially if you go about it the right way. Like you're not like, Oh, we're going to win it by doing all these things that will only work for this year. If you're doing it in a way because you're aspiring to be the best FIBA team in the world and it leads to you winning under 15 nationals, then like you, and you're going to be a heavy pick and roll team then you have to be prepared to be pretty good against a variety of coverages. Because the last thing you want to do is like not cover, let's say for argument, you don't cover how to beat ice for argument's sake. And season's going great and everyone's happy you're winning every game. And then you get into the quarterfinal and suddenly they bust out ice and you've never covered it. And now you're in a timeout, like, fuck it on, fuck, this is what we're going to do. And the players are freaking out. And they also probably thought, you didn't think to cover this, motherfucker, jeez. And, like, so this is probably going to result in getting upset in a quarter and be all tears, and you're going to get fifth. And everyone's, oh, great season. We just blew the quarterfinal. And you should know, yeah, that was on me. And probably should tell the players, like, if they've worked it out and you don't apologize, you've lost a lot of credibility. To preempt that, I mean, I probably wouldn't quite share this with you because it's a little bit too broken propriety, but like, if you can see, so before the season, right, here's all our spacings, right, all our spacings, and then for every spacing, every single coverage that we thought we might encounter. Um, and then how are we going to prevent the coverage? And then how are we going to punish the coverage? The players didn't get this. This was for the coaching staff. And so that I knew and Kenny knew and Cam and B and Rob and our whole staff knew what we're teaching. And we have a plan. And we need to learn all these things. And by the time we play elimination games, we need to have high level of competency with this whole sheet. And then the great thing that happened is that early in the season, we got hit with everything. Shit, Otago probably traded like six coverages in the first game. So by the time we played like the fifth, sixth game, we'd seen borderline every coverage. We'd seen next, we'd seen nail, we'd seen squeeze, we'd seen show, drops, under, switch. And so we were getting like all this competency and in-game reps. We weren't always succeeding. But we're like, we're going to get to the halfway point of the season and there's nothing new that anyone can possibly show us. Um, and, and so that was a good thing. And so you want that. And so in some ways, if you're planning your rep season, one of the things you should be seeking out is like, yo, Waitakere's trapping everything this year. Let's organize a game with them. Like we need to have a week preparing for that and then we need to practice against it in a game so that if it comes up at nationals, Hopefully we had success and your players are like, hey, remember what we did against Waitakere? They're like, yeah, man, we beat them by 30. Okay, that's what we need to do tomorrow morning. And you remind them and hopefully you've been working on it during the season um, and so on and so on. So I don't think it has to be more simplistic. I really think like, I mean, I could get clips, I won't, but like say in lockdown and went back home and then when we came out of it, went and helped Trent with his boys team under 15s. Um, and, you know, that was a good thing to do to be a part of a team. And I could show you clips of them not doing it as well, but where you could certainly see the basics. And that team gave me great confidence because every, we were one of the teams that didn't get to go to nationals because BBNZ had made the tournament smaller. Yeah. So we went to Hoop Nation just so the boys would have a rep season. And when we went to that Hoop Nation and we won it, we weren't the most talented team, but we won it and we won the final pretty convincingly against kind of like an all-star team because we played much better as a team. Yeah. And we played low degree of difficulty basketball. And lots of people at that tournament were like, man, your kids really can shoot it. And I was like, if you saw us do our shooting warm-up drill, that like is a drill that I've done with my NBL teams and Trent's done with good teams. And they finish it in like three minutes. And we're trying to make 10 of these, 10 of these, 10 of these. And like 18 minutes into the practice, they still haven't made any shots. You would like, they're not that good a shooting team. 
But why do they look like a good shooting team? Because we're generating really, really easy shots. Mm. Wide open, catch and shoot threes. And these kids can look good in that context. And then when, like, say, the all-star team we're playing in the final is taking triple step back fadeaway threes over four people, there's a reason we're shooting it better than they are. Not because we're necessarily inherently better shooters. They probably are better shooters than our kids but they're taking extremely hard shots and we're taking extremely easy shots in practice shots and knowing shots. And because I'd had that process. So when I went into saints were like, are we going to shoot it well enough? I was like, well, we managed to get our little babies from New Plymouth to shoot it well enough last year with this. If we follow similar processes, then we will have that level of success. So um, if anything, the under 15 team informed how I, it built my confidence for how I was going to approach coaching saints, not the other way around. It's probably a, um, we're, we're, um, we're basically nearing the end now and I'm probably just going to jump in here for a second. We, we have one more question left and I think this will be the last question. Um, I'll personally just make a comment here before we ask that, cause then we'll, we'll, we'll go. But I think that there's a, there is a, there is a, there is a philosophical framework that you've introduced here that I think absolutely has wide applicability across a very wide range of players and skill levels. And I think that the application obviously depends on context. And one of the things I really appreciate about the way in which you've talked about your teams and your, and, and, and offensive design is that you've, you've set it all up with what are your goals for the season? Who are the players that you have? start there, understand what you're trying to do, but then build a clear vision, build a very clear vision about the kind of shots you want to get, about the kind of action you want to run, and then go deep and get more and more complex over time. And I think that that's a really, really like, just very, very savvy, very smart way of approaching it. So I really appreciate that. Um, I think the last question that we'll throw out here um, is, is DC's question. So He's asking with the 21 Saints, did you always practice starters versus bench in live play um, to develop your combinations or did you mix that up? The other thing I'd add to that, like bullet points that you talked about is commonality of language. Yeah. So to have that common understanding, have a very, very clear understanding of your team's language. Yeah, cool. And then everyone who's going to help you with that team, like I know in New Zealand, we so much have like volunteer assistants and and we kind of coach by ourselves a lot of times yeah. you know the head coach coach by themselves if you're fortunate enough to have someone who's going to help you hopefully they can be at everything but if they can or they can't but they do need to know the language you can't have them kind of even if they don't mean it in a nefarious way but you can't have them rogue right where they're like using different language and different terminology and maybe not on the same page and now the players are confused and that's been a great learning here like we literally don't speak the same language as 90 percent of our players so trying to have a shamani language as opposed to english japanese is very important um and, and it takes more work obviously um but that's a whole another big discussion we could get into about the difference working in a, in a it's not really bilingual a different two languages environment um starters versus bench we didn't always practice starters versus bench um once again i think you think about the purpose is this a practice maybe in pre-season or early maybe in the week if we're talking in season where the main point of this practice is to be like extremely competitive like we're trying to get better in our basketball, like Saints basketball, then sometimes having even teams helps that, you know, to go at each other and, and really battle and have a really competitive practice, close games. To be fair, our bench was very competitive. Even though they were babies, I would say at practice, they probably won 40% of the games. Um, you know, I mean, probably maybe a little bit of a failing of me. Maybe it's a little bit because the Saints is like, the, is about probably slightly different than a lot of the clubs. It's like the Saints are about winning and winning championships. And so like Ezra, Kale, you know, they were phenomenal at practice and they got some of their opportunities in games. Um, but like if we were 
maybe had a little bit more margin for error and the expectations of what we're trying to achieve, we could have thrown them out there a little more. And if they messed it up and we lost, maybe it could be okay. But that's not okay with the Saints. Like we talked about it. Like, I mean, I've obviously been with that club for many, many years. And I talked about it with Jordan. I was like, what do you think is the worst record we could have this year? I'm going to say this after the year. And it still be perceived as being a good season. And we are like 14 and four, probably is the lowest end. You go 13 and five, this is a bad season. You know, which is for every other club in the New Zealand league, a good season. So, um, you know, you feel the, the pressure of winning and so we're going to play who helps us win and we're not going to take risks with that um and if the 42 year old has earned the right to be more trusted then he will play um we sent seven kids to college of those seven kids only one had a scholarship before the season so we did help those kids grow and get future opportunities and when I said like every day I took multiple individuals for 19 kids, I don't think any one of them will feel like they were underserviced or weren't given chances and not a single kid quit through the season, which was huge. Cause normally obviously they fall away as they realize that they aren't going to play or they're not going to be in the rotation, but not a single kid. We had one kid leave early to go to college, but no one quit. We cut a couple people, that's for sure, but no one left on their choice. So I think we had success with those people, but we obviously were about winning with the championship. But they would win maybe at 40% of the time. Later in the practices, like late, later in the week, where we're now like maybe this practice, all week is always about winning the next game. So I think a lot of a change in thought process that ties into this question is previously in my experience with New Zealand NBL, you play, let's say you play on Saturday, and the next game is going to be on Saturday. You play Saturday, and then people on Sunday start the scout preparation, like doing the research and all that sort of stuff. And they practice maybe Monday and Tuesday with no knowledge of the game plan. It's just a generic practice that's about us, about Saints. Wednesday off. Thursday, they start to maybe have the scout ready the game plan and Thursday, Friday becomes about the game plan and you play Saturday. We didn't approach it like that. We don't approach it like that here with Shimani either. We play on Saturday. The, the game plan basically needs to be ready ideally on Sunday so that when we go to Monday's practice, we already know what the game plan is for Saturday. Yes, there will be some tinkering and further thought about what we're going to do in six days' time. But that whole week, we've already planned out, okay, what's the game plan? When We have to teach it to our players. We have four practices. When are we going to teach different aspects of the game plan? We're going to teach this on Monday, this on Tuesday. We're going to reinforce these things on Tuesday. They got a day off on Wednesday. Thursday's film, we're showing that. Then we're reinforcing this. Friday, more film. Then we're reinforcing these. Saturday, shoot around. We bring it all together. We play. So we kind of would take that approach. And so as the week will progress, you're move, moving further and further towards starters versus bench. Or at least having a very clear idea in your mind, what units are you intending to play? So like we've had a lot of injuries with Shimani. We've been playing our two imports that we played five games in 10 days. And because we'd already had all these injuries, we were very shorthanded. And I think Nick played maybe like 203 out of 205 minutes. And Reed played maybe like 200 out of the 205 minutes. And we went four and one. And we almost went five and oh. Um, but uh, one of the games were like, look, we're going to maybe have to sub our bigs out a little bit and we don't have the depth there with the injuries and the um, roster. So Hammer, who's a three, but with a bit more size athleticism, might have to play some big minutes. What unit do they play that we can steal some minutes with Hammer at the four where he can mark their four? And like we need to invest in that in practice. What plays are we going to run when Hammer's at the four? He hasn't practiced it all year. 
We're not going to expect him to know all the plays at the four, but he needs to know maybe our flow at the four, and he needs to know one or two plays. And everyone needs to know if Hammers at the four, this is what we stick to. And then we're going to give him live reps early in the week to get ready. So you're also planning like specific things for the game. Like what units do I need to get ready? What combinations do I need to get ready? Um, and so on and so on. Sometimes it's a carrot and a stick. We certainly had a week. Uh, we played Nelson early in the year. We played really, really badly. Um, and benched one of the imports for the second half. And that's when we pulled away and won by 30. And then at this, and I mean, I told them at halftime, it's like, we do not bring you out here to be the reasons that we lose the game. If you guys don't want to go home, you need to show me something. One of them did, he stayed. One of them didn't, and we started looking significantly. Um, but the next week, they playing on blue team, right? Like, I don't get to see why Ezra has to be on the second team when he's kicking your ass to practice every day, Kerwin. And now in the game, you're not getting it done. I don't know what the fuck you've done to earn being in the white team. So you can be in the second team and let's see how you respond. So they both went in the second team for that week. Kerwin, for the first time, after being there for maybe four weeks, started training hard. So he responded exactly the right way and earned his way by the time we got to the next game. Yes, you've earned the right to start in this game. Romero didn't really respond. He was like, oh, okay and kept drifting on. And he never got back into the starting group. And then ultimately we signed a very good player to replace him and we cut him. And then that player got recalled to the boomers the next day. Mm. But um, <laughs> by that time, we'd already had the meeting with Romero, see you later. And we could have brought him back, but we're like, he's not really good for us. And we want frontline soldiers. And he is not a frontline soldier. Let's roll with the crew that we have and keep searching. And then obviously we never were able to get anyone in so we just rolled with the frontline soldiers we had, you know, and obviously Leon was a huge part of that. Um, and one of the main people we talked about yeah. frontline soldiers. So, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that you would consider as to like DC's question is could be answered very simply, but it's, it's a layered question. As with many coaching decisions, nothing is ever really straightforward. There's, there's a lot of context and people and, um, goals to consider and manage. So um, I think your answer speaks to that um, very much. Um, we probably should should wrap it now. Uh, I think this has definitely been our record uh, for, for session length. Um, and I'm actually have been really, really again, I, I've really enjoyed every single bit. Um, thank you so much, Zico, for, for the time that you spent. And you do, you've really given us so much depth insight um obviously time um so thank you for that um matt you want to you want to kind of add any other comments here before we wrap up yeah no i just want to echo that i mean i think um the, i think what you said just really clever savvy way to um a lot of food for thought that i think can apply to um every level which i think is the real beauty of the session so um thank you zico really appreciate your time um i'm sure we could keep going but yeah <laughs> yeah, it's getting a little bit late. So, um, yeah, awesome. Really appreciate it. Cool. And and thanks to everyone for uh, for coming out and and for those who stuck with us uh, through to the end. Zico, do you want to say any parting words? <laughs> I mean, thank you for everyone's time. Um, thank you for the honor of believing that what I might have to say is is worthy of your time. Um, and you know, hopefully, it's valuable, and hopefully, it, it applies to your teams and. and um, you know, I mean, obviously today we found out that we might be allowed back in the country when this yeah. whole thing yeah, totally. finishes and then hopefully maybe around the traps, we'll get to see some of you and, and your teams. And, and maybe there's a couple of things in there that you, you can you know, take some quiet satisfaction that maybe it's been helpful to people. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. And, and thank you for everything that everyone's doing back home and, and creating a platform where maybe, the likes of Paulie or myself do well enough that someone around the world thinks that we're worthy enough basketball coach to give an opportunity to and, uh, and get to go and experience something uh, different and um, yeah. get some Bandai win bonuses in our, our little envelope. <laughs> this is anything you'll ever experience in New Zealand. Cool. Uh, awesome. Strings it.
observation, not something we're used to. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thanks, everyone. And uh, we hope you have a good night. And we will uh, post the finished recording um, on our YouTube page once it's done. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much.